Good evening, Thousand Oaks, and welcome to the Planning Commission meeting for October 27, 2014. If you could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. This is the public hearing portion of our uh, agenda where if we have items that are not on tonight's regularly scheduled agenda, you have an opportunity to speak. 
We do not have any speaker cards for items not on tonight's agenda. So at this time, I would like to ask Mr. Town any written comments, announcements, or continuances. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have a supplemental packet which contains two items. One is a letter uh, regarding the first case, the Conejo Coastal Properties uh, application. And that's attachment one to the supplemental, and a second is an email from a resident regarding agenda item uh, 6B, which is the Verizon Wireless application, your second case tonight. And that's all I had, thank you. Will we please call the roll? Commissioner Newman? Here. Commissioner Nichols? Yes. Commissioner Reynolds? Here. Commissioner Turpel? Here. Chair Roundtree? Here. Due to a tie uh, at our last commission meeting, this is actually a continuation of that same meeting with Caneo Coastal Properties. Uh, Commissioner Reynolds, we're glad to see you back. You gave us a little bit of a scare. Um, we'll provide you some opportunities to ask all the questions that you have a little bit later. I also want to mention that the testimony already is, has already been given by staff, a number of applicants, uh, outside speakers on the issue. So if there are new questions from any questions posed by commissioners or new information, please focus your questions on those so we don't have a repeat of the same information over again. And I also want to point out that at the end of the uh, discussion, we will have a new vote and any new motions or conditions uh, applied at that time. But right now, I'd like to just confirm that Commissioner Reynolds has received the information from the last meeting, watched it, and it has reviewed the information. Thank you. Uh, yes, I had a scare, too. I, in 10 years, I've only missed, that was my second meeting. So uh, I was very upset that I couldn't be there. I, of course, before the previous meeting, I had gone out to the site with staff. I had reviewed everything. And uh, then when I got back, home from the hospital. I kept that part of my packet and I reviewed the information again and while I was in the hospital that night, I watched the complete meeting from start to finish and so I'm very aware of all the discussion, staff report and the commissioner's discussion that evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would the clerk please call case 6A. Hearing advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 6A regarding case TTM 2014-70162, DP 2014-70161, OTP 2014-70165, and LTP 2014-70226. Applicant, Conejo Coastal Properties, Inc. Request to consider negative declaration, allow a one lot subdivision and allow grading, street and site improvements for the construction of 26 townhomes, removal of 20 oak trees and four toyons, and encroachment into the protected zone of three oak landmark trees. Location 80 and 90 Clay Court. Ms. Pedrosa, you'll be leading our report tonight. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Roundtree. Uh, welcome back, Commissioner Reynolds, and uh, good evening, members of the Commission. Uh, the request in front of you is for the construction of uh, 26 town townhome units at 80 and 90 Clay Court. This is, this is the continuation of the hearing from October 13, 2014, and what you're considering tonight is to adopt the negative declaration, approve the townhome design, uh, merge two lots into one, <clears throat> excuse me, for one lot subdivision, uh, removal of the 20 oak trees, and allow two encroachments, and allow, re of, uh, allow removal of four toyons and one encroachment. And uh, since the last meeting, there has been no changes to the project. A brief uh, review, uh, the project is located at 80 and 90 Clay Court. Uh, to the north, you have Thousand Oaks Boulevard, and uh, <clears throat> to the east, uh, we have the 23 Freeway, and as you enter Clay Court and you go is that uh, you have Jensen Court and goes around Jensen Court. This is a view of the property from Jensen Court. This is the part of the street that is going to be widened, so the existing retaining wall will be pushed back. And um, here we have three toyons that need to be removed and one oak tree that need to be removed from here uh, due to the street widening. This is the view looking at 
south on Clay Court, and this is the western part of the property, and what you see over here is an existing rock wall, and to the further to the end, there's the neighboring property. And this is a view from Pierce Court looking at the property. Uh, in the background, you see one of the residences that is actually on the 8090 uh, Clay Court property. Just to give you a brief uh, review of the site plan, uh, basically we have four buildings, seven units and six unit buildings. They are enter of Jensen Court through a main driveway, and then you have two spurs to the north and south. Uh, the garages are accessed from, uh, from the uh, spur driveways. We do have some additional parking, uh, open parking that is on the entry and also in front of uh, uh, the uh, kind of like a common area slash uh, uh, focal point for uh, that's going to have one of the oak trees that is going to be transplanted. Uh, what again? What we have over here? We have uh, new landscaping. We have some new retaining walls, and uh, and we have a, a, a new planting on the site as well. There are two waivers that are being requested. One is to allow the garage width to uh, to have tandem parking versus a side by side parking, and uh, that's. Uh, uh, a waiver of the standard conditions, and also to allow retaining walls that have exceeding height of six feet. And we do have, in some of the situations on the prop, like I'll go back to the other slide, we have that situation on some of the perimeter walls where the pad is either higher or lower than the Jensen grade, and whenever you have a walking surface that is uh, uh, within five feet of that, uh, of that change in drop and elevation, uh, they need to have a, uh, guardrail fencing on top of the wall, so therefore a six foot retaining wall now it could become basically uh, uh, 10 feet once you put the, the railing on it. This is a front elevation. It's basically a Spanish slash Mediterranean look to the building. Uh, we do have uh, the, the height and number of stories are in compliance with the specific plan 20, which this property is part of. And uh, we also have a combination of uh, patios in, in front of the units with uh, uh, decorative block wall and uh, also wrought iron fences and uh, landscaping around and different materials being used. And also the building has articulation vertically and horizontally. Therefore, it also complies with the architecturally designed guidelines as well as specific plan 20 guidelines. This is high elevations. It kind of shows you some of the articulation on the building. In regards to the oak trees, uh, the lower portion of the properties on the western side is basically an oak woodland that is going to be preserved. Uh, there are existing 42 oak trees that are over two inches in diameter. 20 of them will have no impact. 12 will be removed completely. Uh, one of those 12 is actually a dead oak tree. Uh, eight trees will be transplanted on site, and there's going to be two encroachments. Right now, they're proposing to provide 36 replacement oaks, or the equivalent, and uh, with that, we mean that instead of maybe putting uh, the three to one replacement, to maybe combine the width uh, or the diameters of the trees and then have a larger specimen, so that way they have a better uh, growing situation and they have more space to grow. These are some pictures of some of the existing oaks. The one on the left is a tree that is going to be removed. The one on the, on the right is one of the trees that is going to be transplanted. And this one over here is going to be transplanted to that focal point that I mentioned earlier on the, uh, on, on the site plan. Uh, this one, the environmental review for this project is a negative declaration. And it was prepared in accordance to CEQA. And there are no potential, potentially significant eff effects on the environment. And there's no mitigation required. So the recommendation from staff is that the Planning Commission approves entitlement applications to allow the construction of the 26 townhomes and with all the entitlements listed on, on your report uh, based on the findings and the conditions of approval. And with, with us, we have here members of staff. We have Rick Burgess, our environmental planner. We have John Ennis, our landscape consultant and arborist. Kath Larry from uh, Public Works Traffic Division. And if you have any additional questions, we're here. Thank you, Ms. Pedrosa. Commissioners, any questions for staff at this time? Commissioner Nichols. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Pedrosa, I have a couple of uh, quick uh, follow-ups for clarification, if possible. 
uh, I was reading through the Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan. And in chapter one, it refers to incorporating existing oak trees into landscaped areas. Now, is it uh, staff's understanding that that's incorporating existing oak trees where they are currently growing and that those should be incorporated within the landscape areas? They actually have uh, quite a few oaks that they are remaining in place where they are right now and they have been incorporated in the landscape areas and the ones that cannot remain in their location, they're being transplanted on site and the ones that are not being transplanted on site are not good candidates for transplant or they're not doing well if either way. Uh, I understand that but my question is the intent of the specific plan. Uh, is it to leave existing oak trees where they are and that the development should incorporate those oak trees where they stand and develop their project around the existing oak trees? The intent of specific plan as it is with any other project in any other zone, it is to try to work to the most extent with the existing vegetation that we have on site. However, if you were to always develop just around any existing oak tree, then it will be uh, probably pretty, pretty hard to develop anything anywhere in the city. So the intent is to preserve as much as we can, but at the same time, we need to allow development to happen. Okay, thank you, that, that helps. And then secondly, I was also reading within the specific plan at Thousand Oaks Boulevard, uh, the desire along the boulevard is to incorporate public exterior open spaces. Uh, how, are, are there some predetermined location for these open spaces, or is that just to be determined as the boulevard is developed? Uh, the, the requirement that you're reading it has to do with properties on Thousand Oaks Boulevard. This one is off Thousand Oaks Boulevard, so it does not have the requirement of the public space as in regards to the like public art and public plazas and so forth. That's right on the boulevard only. Is there some place in the specific plan that says that? Because as I was reading it, it just said within the spe specific plan area. I didn't see anything that uh, indicated it was just for properties on the boulevard. If you look back at the beginning pages, it tells you like specific design criteria for the Thousand Oaks Boulevard on the boulevard, and then okay. you have another design criteria for it's off the boulevard. All right, I'll take a quick look at that then. Thank you. And then one last uh, item, and this may be for our oak tree specialist. As I was going through the numbers, and, and, and perhaps you can, I, you may not have this readily available, but as I was looking through this, it appears to me that. Um, between two inches and 10 inches in diameter, there are 27 trees. So the, the far majority are less than, or 10 inches or less. Is that correct? I, I would have to look at the report. We didn't, we didn't make a, a chart like that. If, if, if you're saying that's what it shows, no doubt to, uh, to question okay. that. Okay, all right. That's it for now, thank you. Commissioner Reynolds. Thank you. Um, I do have some questions, and there were things that were answered by, uh, asked by other commissioners and answered, but I'm also going to go down my list that I prepared for the previous meeting. And uh, the first thing is the reduction in the two parking spaces that you've asked them to reduce at the entrance. And now, are those the lower ones or the upper? Those will be the ones facing on the north side. Okay, on, okay, on one particular side then. It's not one on each side. Um, also, is there a condition to that? Can you tell me what condition it is? Or I was trying to find it sitting here and I hadn't. I will find that out for okay. you. And also, has the applicant agreed to that uh, removal of those two spaces? I know it, it was part of the extra spaces. Yes, they have. Okay, they have them. Okay. Um, and I'm familiar with the improvements, okay, that they want on Clay Court, or some people do. Uh, the fencing, which uh, has the applicant agreed to the fencing then? I know there was discussion at the meeting regarding the fencing. At the end of the uh, meeting, I do recall the applicant uh, agreeing to the fence. Uh, however, you know, maybe that's a question we can ask the okay, applicant Okay, but again. the condition hasn't been added to that then. No, the condition has okay. not been added because there was no motion on the, okay. no vote on the motion. And I noticed from being out there several times, even with you waiting that morning when I met with you, what, two weeks ago, uh, there was a lot of, as people come up, court there there's a lot of speeding and then they quickly go around and make a left turn to go up Jensen 
Is there going to be any improvement to that median where the tree is in the middle of the street or that whole median there? Is it going to stay the same width? You, are you talking about the existing clay court? The, yeah, the yes, existing clay court at the bottom, closer to Thousand Oaks Boulevard, where there is that center median there. Everything's going to stay the same there, isn't it? The, yeah, it's almost like a calming device. That in the middle yeah, of the road is a the calming same. device, or what I would, I'm sure that our traffic di division would say the same thing, that it's a calming because it seems like people come around the corner and then all of a sudden that's there, so it even makes them go slower around to turn left on Jensen Court. That's correct. Okay, and I know that they're not using clay court at all. Um, I think that was about it. I was really um, curious about the two parking places. Yes, condition 137. 137. It says okay, required parking, and you go on. on the, and it's in the same paragraph. It says that except the two parallel parking spaces along the entry driveway, okay. northerly entry driveway okay. shall be eliminated. And there's no requirement at all to make any improvements on clay court then because they won't be using that. It's just the backside of their property other than if we do decide to put a restriction that they should fence the edge of that property. Um, that is correct. I, I like the wall. It's really probably better if it was investigated a historic wall. It's probably been there a long time. I remember when there was a mobile home park up there and there was a sp swimming pool company at the corner and there were some swimming pools in there many, many years ago at that corner property. So, but there's no, there's no other no requirement at all to remove Correct. that rock wall. Correct. So, thank you. That's all. Commissioner Nichols. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Town, if I could uh, uh, inquire of you, I was again rereading the specific plan for the boulevard. Uh, and on page 76 under supplemental design guidelines, it says the following guide design guidelines will apply to all properties within the specific plan area. Number one is building form, and then number two is public exterior spaces. So I just I'm going to re ask this question Does uh, how are public exterior spaces to be outlined throughout the specific plan area? Are they pre designated or are these just we, we catch them as we can. Yeah, they're not pre-designated, to sort of answer your first question. Um, and the intent was to incorporate them principally along uh, properties on the boulevard to provide outdoor gathering places, fountains, et cetera, where people could, could uh, relax, slow down, and that would contribute to a more pedestrian-oriented environment. So the idea was, Although it's not uh, um, specifically required in the plan, the idea was to create those spaces along uh, the Thousand Oaks Boulevard. And in fact, there's, there's actually a requirement that a certain portion of that area be set aside for those types of gathering places on the boulevard. Okay, thank you. Any other question, questions? Nope. We're now gonna go to our applicant, Mr. Eric Everhart, Coastal Properties. And for the record, if you can give us your name and city of residence, and you'll have 15 minutes, sir. And staff, thank you very much for having us here tonight. My name is Eric Eberhardt. I am the vice president of development for City Ventures. We're headquartered in Newport Beach, California. My team tonight consists of Denise Ashton, she is our, she's from William Hesmahalt, she's our architect. Uh, Kevin Nerones, he's from StudioPad, Landscape Architects. Uh, Peter Duarte, StudioPad Landscape Architects. Gerardo Gardino, who's our civil engineer from CNV. Richard Campbell is our oak and landmark tree expert uh, from Thousand Oaks. And John Motes uh, Sr., he is the president of Sienna Tree. He's our expert on effectively uh, relocating trees and landmark trees, and is a familiar face in Thousand Oaks. The proposed site is an ideal site, and it's located in very close proximity and walkable, walkable to dining, shopping, and other business venues on Thousand Oaks Boulevard. As you can see, as the site exists today, it is predominantly a business and equipment storage yard with a few scattered and older residential homes. At all times, 
both day and night, trucks and cars drive up the long dirt and gravel driveways or take access off of Jensen Court. Our site, with its current use, is far from a pristine, quiet, or viable habitat. As part of our development, as you can see, uh, we promise to correct the condition along the street there on the left photo by widening the public road, by adding a plantable gravity wall, and installing a pedestrian sidewalk where one is desperately needed. And with that, I'll hand off to Denise Ashton. She's with William Hesmahal Architects. Thank you. Good evening. Um, last time we were here, we talked about the site and its pristine nature, or rather not pristine. We wanted to show this exhibit. Um, this gray area that you see for the site is actually the disturbed and disrupt disrupted parcel of the property. The light green is where there's trees and, and brush. The darker green are the trees that are existing on the site excuse me, on the site, either oaks or landmark trees. So I think you can see that this site is disturbed. The darker lines on there represent where our new buildings are. We did talk about last time um, many iterations that we've been through on this plan. This is a sampling of about five of the studies that we did prior to this study that we um, have today. We had single family homes down off of Clay Court. We had bar buildings that faced out. We had a combination of those trying to save the trees, trying to work with the grades. Um, in a numerous methods of doing that, um, thinking that a small single family would work down on the lower parcel. It just didn't come to pass. We looked at a larger courtyard building up at the top, two of them, uh, really just didn't fit the site, didn't feel good, and um, this site, uh, this is our ultimate, you've seen it a couple times now, um, this is our site plan. We, we love the things that are happening on this site plan as Claudia described it. We have that central entry. We have the focal point of the oak tree. We do have uh, the simplicity but the cleanness of these two different building types, homes that will face out over this open space, homes that will address Jensen. 26 homes. Um, we are over parked based on the um, requirement for 1.75. We are, we are parking at 2.34 for this site. I know that was a topic of last uh, discussion. We are also have um, private greens and patios that happen out in front of these homes. So we feel good about the open space that's being provided in addition to essentially you know, half the site is in open space, and Kevin's going to talk a little bit about the um, the uh, the way we are treating that that habitat. So we're taking this disruptive site, in our opinion, and creating a new habitat. Just quickly, I know we've seen this. Um, these these are are simple but elegant um, townhomes that range in square footages from 1,500 to 1,900, roughly. Um, square feet. They're very handsome. They're going to be um, hitting the market, in, in our opinion, for the people that want to buy here. I'm going to turn it over to Kevin now. Kevin's with Studio Pad. He's our landscape architect. Hi there. Uh, Kevin Narones. I live in uh, Mission Viejo, um, project manager with Studio Pad Landscape Architects. Um, so the slide right now is our uh, tree chart. Um, the clay court site currently has 48 existing oak and landmark trees. We work closely with the city staff, consulting city arborist John Ennis and our own independent arborist Richard Campbell to survey each oak and landmark tree. As you can see in this chart, there are 24 oak and landmark trees to be protected in place, nine to be boxed and relocated on this site, including the 40 by 40 foot specimen tree. Uh, 15 will be removed and replaced with 17 7 to 8 and a half inch caliper 72 inch box oak street oak trees uh, This next slide illustrates where the trees are currently located on the site uh, As you can see the 24 oak landmark trees to be protected are colored green uh, mostly to the west portion of the site the nine oak landmark trees to be re relocated are colored yellow and the uh, 15 trees to be removed are colored brown. Um, several of the trees marked for removal are located on a steep slope condition uh, within the road widening zone, or they're intertwined with trees to be protected in place or transplanted. Um, 
All the other trees within the western slope area that aren't oaks and landmark trees are um, proposed to be protected in place. Uh, this is our relocation map, and it illustrates uh, that tree 17 will become the focal tree and centerpiece of this project. Uh, we have proposed to relocate four additional oaks to the main entry and street side of buildings one and two along Jensen. The remaining four oak toy-on transplants are located just south of the open turf space. Um, in addition to our arborists, we have worked closely with Senna Tree Company and owner John Moat. Uh, we walked the site with John to survey all these trees, and in conjunction with our arborist, uh, he helped us determine which trees were good candidates for transplanting. Uh, Senna Tree Company has a, a very good success rate with their oak transplants, and they have done work in the city of Thousand Oaks before. Uh, John is here tonight, and he can answer any technical questions with regards to moving of the trees. Uh, so this is our overall landscape plan, um, and it illustrates the use of enhanced pavers at the entry driveway and community open space. Uh, the central relocation of Tree 17 will allow it to be viewed every time residents and guests enter the community. This oak and the oaks at the main entry will be uplit uh, to provide a dramatic entry experience at night. Views are also provided from the community gathering space in the middle and activity lawn looking down into the oak grove on the westerly slope. And finally, uh, this slide illustrates this project's great amenities and interesting and dynamic planting. The centrally located barbecue area will provide a retreat for residents with close proximity to the spacious turf area that can be used for various activities. And it is the only turf area on the site. Planting around the amenity areas and adjacent to the buildings will utilize various drought tolerant aloes, agaves, and other succulents, as well as randomly placed boulders and massings of grasses. Um, the proposed plant palette shall not use any high use water plants, and uh, drought tolerant species of trees and shrubs will be used throughout as much as possible. Thank you. We wanted to thank you again. In summary, where we could have added density, we exercised restraint. Where we could have just met code, we took one step better. Where we could have disturbed, where a disturbed and, and degraded current condition exists, we propose to create a new and greatly improved condition. Where tree experts never agree, we have an extensive tree management plan that has the blessing of the city's Oak expert, John Ennis, our oak expert, Richard Campbell, our oak tree uh, relocation expert, John Moat, who is the president of Sienna Tree, as well as our own architects in, at StudioPad. Our plan, our extensive tree management plan, meets the goals and objectives of this, of this city. That's why we have the full endorsement of city staff. At City Ventures, we pride ourselves on not just building homes, building houses. We, we actually create homes, homes that are destined to build great memories in, homes that our buyers take great pride in, and at the same time enjoy the lifestyle that a walkable local business community and its venues offer. As you know already, adding quality residential to an area encourages and enables local businesses to hire, to expand, and to prosper, even during economic downtimes. My team and I want to thank staff and uh, the Planning Commission tonight, as well as um, our consultants and those who have worked with us uh, in, within the city to uh, get here tonight. We are respectfully available to answer any questions. I've got the, the full team here tonight, and we're able to answer any questions that you may have. And again, uh, we thank you for this opportunity. We are honored to be here. We'd like to find more projects to, to come in and do. And thank you again very much on behalf of the team. Thank you, Mr. Everhart. Appreciate it. Questions from commissioners? Commissioner Reynolds. Um, I wanted to talk to the landscape. If he would come back up, 
please. You mentioned a, good evening. You mentioned a 72 inch box. Yes, as the replacement trees. Of what, an oak tree? Yes, yeah, so, so for the 15 oaks that are being removed, we're proposing a one-to-one -one replacement ratio with a seven and a half to eight inch caliper tree that'll probably be around 72 inch box size. Okay, I was just surprised because I think the largest we've ever discussed is 48 inches. And when you said 72, I thought maybe I misunderstood on it. So, but you're doing that then instead of a three to one, you want larger trees uh, replaced, put on the property. Right, and mm -hmm. the idea is um, with the three to one ratio, we really don't have the proper room to properly space these oak trees. Um, uh, these species of oaks, they get very large and we would have to you know, encroach into retaining walls and get very close to buildings okay. and plant them on a, you know, on center spacing that really isn't healthy for the oak tree. So we think by you know, increasing the size and reducing the number, we're you know, being you know, more responsible and efficient with these replacement trees and they can become something, you know, grow into healthy trees instead of crammed in there just for the sake of numbers. And how soon after the project begins would you be bringing these box on site? At the very end or in the middle of the process? Um, that might be a question. Um, Only because the 72 inch, I mean, that's a big tree. I don't know if you'll have to use cranes or what you'll have to use in order to um, place them on the property. John. I'll let our, our uh, tree relocation specialist Je handle that question. Hello there, John Moat, Senate Tree Company. Good evening. Uh, to answer your question, yes, that would require a crane, and you'd probably bring in that tree um, sometime after rough uh, finished grade is set, walls are built. Okay, before, oh, before framing, then you'd have it's to bring It's a that. logistical thing. Yeah. It might be after the framing and stuck on the uh, scaffoldings mm -hmm. removed, and then we can get in and get the big trees in probably right. before flat work like mm -hmm. ornamental hardscapes and things like that. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. That's all. Commissioner Trupel? Yeah, Mr. Eberhardt, could I have you back up real quick? The, um, just to go back, because we were, we were talking about this on the 13th, you still don't have a problem with the condition as staff wrote it with putting the, the fence no, we do not. Okay. Now, the other thing is we had a supplement, an attachment that came in with uh, us today. Unfortunately, I was down in Los Angeles. I just only had, to, had the opportunity to read it uh, this afternoon. Um, have you spoken to the, the, uh, your adjacent neighbors there, the Tuttles, on any of these requests that they're talking about? No, no I haven't uh, talked to him since just prior to the last planning commission. So, because I'm looking at a couple of these things that are talking about a eucalyptus tree that's leaning over the property, and if I remember, we spoke about that last time. Um, the uh, and the widening of clay court are the, are those areas that that cause difficulty for you, or? Yeah, I think in addressing that, um, definitely we would be willing to go ahead and, and put up the fence. The one thing that we can't do is we can't widen property that's not ours, and it's essentially. It's, it's widening an area that doesn't belong to uh, Mr. Tuttle either. Um, and then obviously just beyond the fence, he's, he's actually parking in the, in the right of way. Of but you've had no conversation with him at all on this? Uh, no, I did not. But however, if there's a, a eucalyptus or another tree that, that is um, leaning, of which there's, there's fear that it could fall down, then uh, we'll definitely deal with that with our experts. Yeah, you know what, I, I, I don't want to get to put in, in throwing conditions on this. I just yeah. like people to work together. Yeah, no, and, well, and, and no. That's what we're to, talking as, about. So. As, far as, I'm, as far as I understand, he now supports the project. Okay. Um, well, I may have to go back to our staff on that, but thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Everhart. Before you sit down, caught you just in time. I'll, I'll ask the question. You can defer if you need to. Um, I brought up this question about pu public open space because one of the things I was considering was 
could the residual open space area be considered a public open space area, which would be contrary to, to Commissioner Trapel's request for a fence at the, below. I was thinking maybe a front, uh, fence up above at the daylight area, and then allowing the uh, public access to that uh, woodland area down below and, and using it as a public open space, keeping the rock wall down below, keeping the pillars down below, and then making that an area of interest for the public to maybe have a trail or something in there. Would you be open to something like that? Uh, yes, we would. We could uh, have the fence, as you're saying, up uh, more on the top of the slope than below. Yes. Okay. Um, and I was noticing uh, on the exhibits here, the first time I just kind of caught my attention with those aha moments, trees one through nine are down in that area called Clay Court. So just for clarification, are those on the property or are those on the Clay Court right-of-way? No, we're, everything that we are planting is, is planted on Clay Court property. Well, these were existing trees to remove. I mean, I mean to, uh, trees to remain, oak trees one through nine. The thought were down in the Clay Court right-of-way. It appeared to me that it was off-site and in the right-of-way. Okay. So I'm trying to determine if those are on the property or within the public right of way? Um, the, uh, the items, the ones that you're talking about, uh, you're talking about C, V, O, T, T, dash one through, yeah, through B, O, T, dash one. Yeah, but those are outside of our property, so we're not, we're not touching those. Okay, so are those included in the 45 trees? No, uh, are these included in the 45? Yes, they are. So then why would they be included if they're off site? Well, I think what we tried to do is we tried to take a detailed approach to make sure that we accounted for each and every tree. So the the answer to your question is, they are off site. Okay. Uh, we're not and not we're, we're not treating them with we're not taking touching them as far as any changes to their. Okay. Yeah. So then there would actually be only thirty six trees on site. If those nine are off site. That math, yes, that would be correct. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions from commissioners at this time? Yeah, Chairman? Mr. Yeah, Mr. I, I'd like clarification on, on just what I was listening to Commissioner Nichols say. You say they're off site, now it's 36, now it's not. And can, can I just have clarifications just off of Commissioner Nichols' question? Can you just re answer that, please? Yes, the, the the nine trees that were that we just discussed, those are actually off site. They're on the uh, parcel U that does not belong to us. Um, and I think that was discussed at the prior meeting that uh, there were some uh, uh, requested trimming of those trees, and that's sort okay. Of thing. We're on the same page. I yeah. got it. Thank you. I didn't mean to cut you off. If you wanted to say anything else, but the no, I. I just no, want to make no, sure I that think, I didn't. I think one thing that, that was not mentioned uh, is that uh, we're working with John uh, Moat in regards to the relocation of the trees that do need to be relocated. And um, as you are probably aware, with Sienna Tree, their success rate is 95%. Uh, so we feel very comfortable, comfortable that we've got the right people on the team to make sure that this happens. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from commissioners at this time? All right, we're now going to move on to our speaker cards. And for the record, we have nine written cards. So thank you all for taking the time to, to make the written statements. These will become part of the public record. And I will pass those down. We have 13 speaker cards. So based upon policy and procedure with 13 speaker cards, each speaker will be given three minutes to speak. So I'll be giving you a who's up, who's on deck, and who's in the hole. That's some World Series jargon there, in case you're not a baseball fan. You lost that one. Obviously, you're not watching the World Series. So leading off in that same frame, we'll be starting off with uh, Mr. Dave Tuttle, followed by Mark Sellers, followed by Rick Principe. So if we could have Mr. Tuttle. There he is. And as a reminder for all speakers, you'll need to give us your name and city of residence. 
Good evening, Mr. Tuttle. Good evening, Chairman Roundtree, members of the Commission. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. Um, I'd like to reiterate uh, very quickly a couple of things, or a few things that we talked about. The uh, tree at the bottom of the slope near the entrance, we're concerned with access into our property. Oh, excuse me. Dave Tuttle, uh, 102 Clay Court, Residence Moore Park. We own the property next to uh, uh, Eric Eberhardt's and uh, Coastal Properties. The tree at the bottom of the abandoned house, we, I mean, uh, we're concerned with the placement of that tree and along that bottom slope. We're concerned also with the eucalyptus tree, which was mentioned again. Thank you, there hasn't been any feedback on that. Um, the removal of the existing columns, uh, Ms. Reynolds, I'm sorry, but I take a little issue. I think that that fence, that wall was put in after Coastal Properties acquired the property. It wasn't there originally. And neither were the columns, and we believe it's a safety issue. We're also concerned with future, and we've been addressed by staff for the drainage down onto uh, Clay Court easement and Parcel U. Um, the removal of the existing septic system that's on Clay Court that was put in on uh, the small house that's there. Um, next to the abandoned house. Uh, installing the fence, we're, we're grateful that if that's going to be installed at the bottom of the slope. And um, Chairman Nichols, I, I'd be concerned with the access of other people on that slope was the reason we wanted a fence there because that's an easement and there's traffic and that's why we'd want the fence at the bottom of the slope. Have no objections to utilizing it for public use. But the issue would be to prevent people from coming down that slope and keeping people off of it onto the parcel U or the easement there. Um, then the, uh, the other issue was uh, that we're concerned with is the widening of the slope. And there's been a lot of discussion about uh, preservation of oak trees. And I'd like to say, just for the record, that the canopy of the oak trees on the bottom of Clay Court, the parcel, goes over the whole driveway in some places by the drainage ditch. And we had to deal that at one time. We dealt with that when we put in a septic system with inspections. We moved abandoned cars in the area. The area has been cleaned up. So we're concerned with those trees and the future development. And if the intent is to preserve oak trees, we're concerned we wanted to widen this, the easement there, and particularly if it's not if it's on parcel U, to widen, have five feet grace into that period, so we don't, into that space, so we don't end up uh, like Herbs Road, where we're at a quandary of what to do in the future. We want the ability, and as someone who's attended the meetings of the Boulevard Committee and the support of the Boulevard Committee, incidentally, we're not opposed to this project. We'd like to be, the ability to develop our property in the future, and having a a sizable enough easement that we can get in and out without being impacted by existing oak trees or have to deal with oak trees. As it is now, the oak trees are cantilevering over. Somebody mentioned during the last meeting that the easement was approximately 40 foot. It's about 20 feet at the most, or, or, or about 14 feet wide. And that's still under the canopy of the trees that exist. Excuse so, me, Mr. Tuttle, but we are for some reason, our timer is not okay. working for the three minutes, so we're over our time, but if you could just wrap it up. I'll wrap we'll... it up. We would, we would like, we would greatly appreciate if you would consider taking a look at the future for the widening of, of that easement, and particularly if that's not, if those trees are uh, parcel U, then we'd like to have like five feet, additional feet on that side, so that it's wide enough for the future, for the development of that property, for fire trucks, for future access. Thank Mr. Tuttle, I do, I do have a question for you, though. Um, yes, sir. On further inspection of the property and the access back to your property, I noticed one of those large oak tree branches that's got significant damage on it, obviously from maybe some of your trucks, which are taller. Who do you seem to be is responsible for trimming that to provide access to your own property? Since we have a piece of property that no one seems can find the owner, this, this lot you, what has been your experience as an owner as to how to deal with that tree? Because it's not a small limb. This, this is a huge limb. On the underside, it's been cut away. What's your experience with the city been? Well, there hasn't been any real direction there because there is nobody that really has claimed responsibility for that area. We do weed abatement in there uh, periodically, 
and there have been limbs that have fallen down that uh, previous people have pushed into the barranca, which need to be cleared out, which I think we're going to address. But there is no real direction with that. That would have to be directed to the city staff. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions of our speaker before I let him go? Thank you, Mr. Tuttle. Oh. Thank you very much. Next up will be Mark Sellers, followed by Rick Principe, followed by Kay Sikra. Good evening, Mark Sellers, uh, here on behalf of the property owner, Russ Goodenoff, as well as here as a member of TOBA in the Business Improvement District Board. And I've been involved with that specific plan for quite some time. Uh, I think the overriding goal of the specific plan was to create uh, economic interest in upgrading the properties along the boulevard, such as this particular property. The goal was to bring as close as possible to the boulevard residents to the boulevard, new residents, in densities that are far greater than 12 units per acre. Uh, the discussion generally is around 30 units an acre. So I think what you got tonight is a project that is substantially below the de densities anticipated by the mixed use concepts in the specific plan. Um, if you look at the site from the top, it, uh, the, the green shows up in about one third of the site. So you do have a, a site, that, a project that's working with the site. I think the oak tree, was mentioned about the oak tree, the relocation in my experience is, is far higher than the 60% that uh, Commissioner uh, Nichols was worried about. Uh, the same consultant worked with me on a project up at uh, uh, Canaan Road in Westlake and uh, relocated a number of oak trees very successfully there, large oak trees. Uh, and I, I think when you balance the two goals, the goal here is to try to get housing closer to the boulevard so they can walk and shop on the boulevard, go to restaurants, not get in their cars, and basically reduce the carbon imprint. Uh, that is, to me, a, a far greater environmental issue than relocating these oak trees. And with that, I encourage you to vote for the project. Any questions from our speaker? Thank you, Mr. Sellers. Next up, Rick Principe, followed by Kay Sikra, followed by Yvonne Brockwell. Good evening, uh, Planning Commission. I'm Rick Principe. I'm a chairman of the Thousand Oaks Boulevard uh, Business District, as well as chairman of the Thousand Oaks Boulevard Association. And I'll kind of make mine brief today, and, and it's really around this specific plan, this document, this document that we've worked over 25 years to put together. And not only did we work 25 years, but we worked extremely close with the staff, extremely close with city council, extremely close with all the residents here in Thousand Oaks. This plan supersedes probably most of the zoning uh, that you're familiar with, and I'm sure all of you have, but if not, you need to read and review this plan. It's created a new zoning called SP20 that covers the three miles along Thousand Oaks Boulevard. And the reason it was created is because the zoning as we knew it before could not accomplish what we wanted to do. This project before you today meets the requirements of the specific plan. It has all the benefits we're looking for, and as Mark Seller says, it's creating that synergism and enthusiasm along the boulevard. The Interesting thing about this, this was unanimously approved three years ago, I believe, 2011. But I know there's a couple of issues that went back and forth. I need to clarify something. There is, as such, no density indicated in the specific plan. The density is created by the guidelines, the setbacks, the uh, frontage off the boulevard. If you read the specific plan, you'll see that the changes that have taken place, we're now allowed to go up to 50 feet, three stories. We're allowed to mix it with retail. We can do freestanding is what's presented here. So when you put all these formulas together, the old RPD 30 or RPD 20, that went out the window. In fact, right now, there is a amendment to the specific plan, not the specific plan, actually it's in the general plan. General plan had an old carryover, I believe, of RPD 30, and that's going to, plan, that's going to the city council now to get changed. So the guidelines for density depends on the property itself. We might have some properties that can only have uh, RPD 20 and some might have RPD 50 because of the way they're configured, the way you have the units and all. So that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing uh, that I've heard a couple of times uh, is talking about 
families and the parks and the uh, uh, impact this might have. Uh, if you read the plan on page 142, it specifically says that the specific plan as it's indicated in here with the units that were allocated has no impact on the park district or the parks within the area. Uh, the type of use that's coming to the boulevard and demand are basically around the millennials who want to locate down in this uh, area where they can walk to the restaurants, they can walk to shopping, they have entertainment, they have everything around. These units might only be occupied by one person, maybe two, we don't know. It's anticipated that most of them will probably be one and two bedroom units. Uh, I Excuse think me, Mr. Principe, we're beyond our three minutes, so if you can wrap it up and we're gonna to try to reset our timer, a little technical difficulty, but if you could kind of pull it all together because we, we do have okay. a number I will of speakers. Thank you, uh, I appreciate it. I was it. thinking that because of association, I thought the, uh, uh, you got 15 minutes, but There might be fine. some additional questions. I'll, I'll wrap it up. No, that's okay. Uh, I, I could cl I'd close real easy. I just really go back to the plan. I think that if you review the plan and look at the plan, you'll find that everything we're talking about tonight is extremely consistent. Uh, this is going to be coming to the Planning Commission and City Council now. There are a lot of projects that are uh, being worked on on the boulevard, and I think it's the greatest thing that could happen to Thousand Oaks, and I think the residents uh, feel the same. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Principe. I appreciate it. Okay. Next up will be Kay Sikra, followed by Yvonne Brockwell, and then Chase Rashid. And just as a reminder, I'd love to grant everybody 30 minutes or more. <laughs> I would be here, I'm, I really would, but we have to limit it. So if we could, and we'll have some technical support here that when you get close to your three minute, you'll see a little yellow light in front of you. That's just, that'll be an indicator that, up. Oh, I better start pulling okay. it together. It's working now? I'm hopeful. <laughs> okay. I'm hopeful. Yeah. Okay. So just your name and city okay. of residence for the record. Thank you. I'm Kay Sikra. I live in Thousand Oaks. Um, I would like to thank Commissioner Newman and uh, Commissioner Nichols for your no vote last week. Um, you have the, the people's wishes in mind. Um, I don't think Thousand Oaks citizens could any, be any more clear on the point that we do not want our oaks or toyons or any other protected trees destroyed. If you destroy them, how can you even say they're protected? Um, can, uh, to even consider doing this in the name of the specific plan makes me wonder if a moratorium should be enacted on the specific plan. Um, perhaps an ad hoc committee should be formed to review if this is really what we wanna do to our city. Uh, since the, all the building that has been going on on Los Feliz, I have never heard so much noise. I live right on Hillcrest. When we first moved here 10 years ago, the only noise we heard at night, the only sound we heard was a distant train. Now we hear helicopters, we hear sirens, we hear chases, tire squalling, we hear so much noise. And to say that this is a, a walking um, plan, why then do they have parking areas so people can bring in their cars? I don't think this is that uh, people are gonna be walking. More and more cars, we have a traffic tsunami on its way. These huge high density projects are ruining our city. My kids are millennials. They want our city to stay beautiful. They plan on living here, but they want our city to stay beautiful. I think there's other options. People have, um, there's plenty of other options. Anybody who wants to live in Thousand Oaks can find a way. I know my family did. Um, and also, as far as people, where are all the jobs on the boulevard? That you're building all these apartments, but where are all the jobs? My husband drives to Oxnard for work. We live here in Thousand Oaks and we commute. I think a lot of people do that. If you're just going to build housing, then, um, you know, I think people are going to be commuting. I think um, traffic tsunami is on its way and we want our trees and, um, and the wildlife that lives in those trees 
for every tree you chop down, the, every tree is high density zoning for all the, the acorn woodpeckers that live there and the squirrels, all the animals, the birds, all the different creatures. Okay, I'm done. Apparently the yellow light did not come on. Oh, I had it hidden so, anyway. So, oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. But okay, thank you. Thank you very much for coming down. I appreciate it. Any questions of our speaker? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Next up, Yvonne Brockwell. And that'll be followed by Chase Rashid, followed by Reese Goodenough. Hi, good Hello, evening. I'm Yvonne Brockwell, and I live in Thousand Oaks. And I was trying to be a little more prepared, but I, I'm afraid I got thrown off with the new math on the trees here tonight and a little bit of other wonky math that seems to be happening, and I'm just feeling a little... This whole project just doesn't feel like it's planned correctly. I feel like the city of Thousand Oaks deserves more, deserves more thought put into it, more consideration. Um, I left last week's meeting on this, you know, feeling like uh, Commissioner Nichols' suggestion of a village-like format which works around the trees and other natural features would create a much more desirable product. And our city deserves that, and our residents deserve that, to uh, bring in this project and just imprint it and remove native oaks, protected toyons because they don't fit with the project. It's just all contrary to what this city has engendered for so long. Um, you know, and then there's other issues that keep coming to mind. I went and walked to the property last week. I was there at 7.30 in the morning prior to most of the businesses being open. There's no street parking around there. How are residents supposed to accommodate guests if they're having a party or a gathering in their home? five guest spaces in this development, I don't see how that would be accommodated. My experience with millennials is they like to entertain. Where are these people going to park? In addition to that, while I was there, um, I keep hearing this space at the bottom or the lower portion of the property referred to as tonight as drainage, a barranca. Um, is it not an intermittent creek? you know, that, that runs on the lower portion of the property, and how will the removal of 1,400 cubic yards of soil impact the watershed? We have to be very careful about how we're impacting our watershed. This is very clear to us right now. How is it going to recharge groundwater if we fill it with soil or divert it? We're already in a position right now where we're gonna to have to relook at all of our infrastructure throughout the city and to create more problems down the road right now because we want to please someone because they purchased a piece of property that isn't working right for them. It, it lacks foresight. I think we really need to take our time with this and really consider what's in store for us for the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Brockwell. Any questions for our speaker? Thank you again, ma'am. Next up will be Chase Rashid followed by Russ Goodenow, followed by Sherry Blessing. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Commissioner. My name is Chase Rashid. I've been a resident of Thousand Oaks for 15 years. I rise in opposition to this development. This development will require the removal of a number of oak trees. And frankly, I think it's a number that is far too much for any development. This city is called Thousand Oaks, not 100 Oaks, not 200, not 999 Oaks. We've got to preserve our environmental heritage, and we cannot compromise that environmental heritage to please developers or to bring in economic development. We can provide economic development and growth and housing growth while still maintaining our character. Now, from what I've heard from the developer, there seems to be, with all due respect, a little bit of mendacity or perhaps just a, a whole bunch of, I don't know what's going on, but it seems like the developers are a bit confused about what they are doing with this property. We've heard, well, no, it's not part of our property. We don't own that, but we include it in the plan. So there's just a lot of, like I said, a bit of mendacity or a bit of, I don't know what's going on, but I rise in opposition to this and I respectfully urge a no vote. This is a bad project. Thank you. 
Thank you. To, not to play principal, but one of the things that you try to do in a public forum is try to keep applause down to not encourage or discourage from others from voicing their opinion, which may be for or against a project. So with all due respect. Mr. Um, Chair, I do have a question for the speaker. Great. Mr. Rashid, could you please come up to the speaker again? We have a question. Thank you very much. And not to delay this, first of all, I, I love the way you speak. I'm a voiceover actor, and oh my gosh, if I, okay. I could hire you in a heartbeat, there's no question. The question is, are you aware that when an oak tree comes down in the city that the developer has to put three trees at least back in for everyone that comes out? Oh yeah, I'm aware. Okay, that's all I want to know. And have you read the uh, Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan that was passed back in 2011, what we're trying to do between Moore Park Road and Duesenberg Drive? Oh yeah, I've read it. Very you have? Well. Yes. That's all I have to ask for you. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Next up, Mr. Goodnow, followed by Sherry Blessing, followed by Dave Gobranson. <clears throat> Good evening, commissioners. I come before you tonight uh, actually wearing two hats. One of them is as owner of uh, Canal Coastal Properties, the owner of the Clay Court property in question, and the other as an or original member of the Thousand Oaks Boulevard Association, TOBA, and the Associated Business Improvement District that created the specific plan which includes Clay Court. I would like to mention one thing that I don't have prepared, but as far, I, I know that property better than anybody. And there's a great number of those oak trees are in the two, two and a half, three inch range. My reason to purchase Clay Court <clears throat> was to locate my boulevard business, Cal U Rent, in 2000. Cal U Rent Properties began searching for a suitable location and purchased the first Clay Court property in 2001. In 2003, it changed its name to Canal Coastal Properties. In 2006, we placed the Clay Court property up for sale, and during the eight years it has been up for sale, there has been no interest in purchase for any commercial use. The only renewal interest has been with residential. City Ventures' original plan called for a density of 15.4 with 34 units, and they scaled that back down to 26. Based on the 2.2 acres we are selling them and the proposed 26 units, project density is 11.8, which is far below the medium plan density of 15 in the specific plan. The concern about noise levels voiced at the last meeting will be irrelevant due to Caltrans construction on the interchange of highways 101 and 23. The improvements scheduled for completion by December, I believe, of next year, will include sound walls along the on and off ramps. Cal plan, Caltrans even plans on installing the first plexiglass sound walls on the interchange. This city has had too many wholesale developers who purchase a property, get development approvals, and then attempt to resell the property. The city is then stuck with banked housing units that were taken out of our inventory yet without a prospect of using those units for actual construction. City Ventures is not a speculator, they are builders. The economies of Europe are built out, but that does not mean that they slow or stop growth. The vibrancy of the German economy, for example, is that it is in a constant process of renewal. Older developments that do not answer current needs are torn down. Tearing down the old homes on Clay Court and replacing them with luxury living is the same process as is happening in Europe. It is much more renewal than growth. Renewal fosters a sense of vibrancy. If there is no vibrancy in a local economy, businesses start to have a city look. They defer maintenance, they don't paint as often as they should, they don't slurry seal their parking lots, as often as needed. Vibrancy excuse, changes to a sense of stagnation. Excuse me, sir. I wish I could give you 15 I'm, minutes. I'm just finishing up. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. My request is that you uh, certainly consider this and you do not allow Thousand Oaks to stagnate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for our speaker? 
Thank you, sir. Next will be Sherry Blessing, followed by Dave Gobranson, followed by Dennis Bloom. Good evening. Good evening. Sherry Blessing, resident of Thousand Oaks. I'm a commercial realtor here in the area with Lean Associates, and I'm also the administrative secretary for the Thousand Oaks Boulevard Association. I'm here tonight to share with you and others in attendance why I strongly support the project for residential condominiums at Clay Court from a real estate professional's pr perspective. I know and represent several property owners along Thousand Oaks Boulevard, and specifically those in this specific plan. In the last few years since the real estate crash, I have been working diligently along with my fellow commercial realtors in the area to assist the retail and office property owners along the boulevard to fill their vacancies or sell their properties. I recently sold two properties very close to the project, 611 and 621 East Thousand Oaks Boulevard. I sold those properties for the owners not because they wanted to sell them, but because we could not get a tenant to lease them. I represent a property owner around the corner from the project, which recently spent over a million dollars in renovating one of the oldest strip centers on the boulevard. The strip center directly in front of the project is also underway with a complete renovation. It has been years since both of these properties have been 100% leased. Last week I ran a survey of vacancies along the boulevard and surrounding areas. In the specific plan alone, there are approximately 57 retail vacancies and approximately 79 office suite vacancies. That is not including the spaces on both sides of the specific plan going west, east, and north along Teo Boulevard. The retail spaces in other areas of Thousand Oaks, not including Newbury Park, are well over 50. There are 57 in the specific plan alone. We have witnessed the property owners renovating their properties at their cost to provide beautiful centers for their tenants and the community. They were not given grants for financial support in any way. The property owners that have vacancies need and want tenants to fill their retail and office spaces and need residents within walking distance to help with that effort. Over the last few years we have seen, and I've even helped them to my own personal dismay, lease their vacant spaces to massage parlors. There are currently 14 massage parlors in the specific plan alone, and I get calls every week for another one looking to open. Now tattoo parlors are allowed. Clay Court is an attractively designed development that will easily bring residents to the boulevard and improve the local commerce. This project and hopefully others that are currently at the city awaiting the long approval process will be accepted and we can all see activity, business, and the pedestrian friendly atmosphere the community voted for along Thousand Oaks Boulevard become a reality. If not, the property owners will again become desperate for income and fill their spaces with more massage parlors and tattoo parlors, among other not so attractive uses. They don't own these buildings to have vacancies. They own them to give small businesses an opportunity to serve and work in their community, in addition to having an investment. Some of the property owners depend on the rental income as their sole support. I encourage you to pass this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blessing. Next up will be Dave Gobranson, followed by Dennis Bloom, followed by Sam Manfredi. Dave Gobranson, a nearly 40-year resident of Thousand Oaks, a business owner on the boulevard, a property owner, a board member of TOBA and the BID, and uh, as a businessman across the street uh, from this project, the merchants around there lovingly refer to the west end of the boulevard as the dead end of Thousand Oaks Boulevard. So I'm happy to address the Planning Commission tonight because you have the opportunity to fulfill a 20 plus year dream of property owners and business owners on the boulevard. We've worked very hard to implement this specific plan in order to energize the boulevard with new businesses supported by the mixed use of downtown residency. It would be nice to have busy res uh, restaurants, hair salons, appliance stores, and maybe even a grocery store at the west end of the boulevard instead of those massage parlors and vapor bars and tattoo parlors. Before you tonight is a well-planned, targeted, millennial-level project. Now, millennials, as you know, are commonly known as dinks, double incomes, no kids. When you ask millennials 
if they would raise their kids in such a location, and I have two in my own family, most of them say they would prefer to live in a single family residence near a park and good schools, which doesn't sound much like our boulevard. Lofts and one bedroom apartments lend themselves to investors speculating and purchasing for rentals or Section 8 housing. Now, that's not currently what we're looking for in these areas. The parcel under consideration this evening has been analyzed ad nauseum for topography, soils, access sensitivity, protected trees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Both the developer and the staff have weighed in on these subjects, and the consensus was favorably reached by both sides. It is now time for you to do your job and weigh in and support the majority interests in the specific plan and approve this project as the first project to demonstrate your support for the City Council approved Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gobranson. Do we have any questions for our speaker? The next speaker will be Dennis Bloom, followed by Sam and Freddie. Followed by Kathy Goodspeed. Hi, I'm Denny Bloom. I'm a, I live at, uh, in Westlake. I'm also a director on the uh, Thousand Oaks Owners Association and I'm committee member of the bid. That's one hat. The other hat is I sold the property to the property owner. That's the other hat. I don't really know which hat to talk under right speak now. And all the speakers in front of me really have said. Mr. Bloom, if you could speak into the mic. Really Thank said you. Appreciate it. What I was going to say. So I'll just mention a couple things. Uh, I made, I think in your packet, you have five letters of support from automobile repair shops around the property from last week or two weeks ago. All those people are excited because there's going to be 52 cars right across the street. <laughs> and all they have to do is bring them across the street and get them fixed. They can go home and have a cup of coffee and wait for the cars to get fixed. That's exactly what our plan was supposed to do. And when you talk about extra driving or this and that, sure, people are going to work out of town. But they're going to come home. They're going to be able to walk down to a restaurant. Geno's is right on the corner. They can get their car repaired right around the corner. This is exactly what we're trying to do. So with that, I'm not going to talk any further. I'm just going to say I hope you support it. We've worked very hard at it. Staff supports it. Please support it tonight. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. Are there any questions for our speakers? Thank you again. Next will be Sam Manfredi, followed by Kathy Goodspeed, followed by Taylor Scott Champagne. Good evening, commissioners and staff. I was just asking Denny how many years ago he sold the owner of the property. Uh, it was 25 years, is that what you said, Denny? Russ, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 10 years ago, okay. I've been a resident here over 30 years, and I've been working with the City of Thousand Oaks staff since 1992 on various properties. I may not have always agreed with City staff on every decision, but I do have faith in the City review process and respect for their recommendations, in that I know the staff is always trying to act in the best interest of the City of Thousand Oaks. I have no involvement in this project at all, other than it's good for the city of Thousand Oaks. It's approved by staff, it's in compliance with the specific plan. The specific plan is important to the advancement of the city of Thousand Oaks. Uh, Sherry Blessing was talking about the vacancies and everything else, the massage parlors and all this. That's why after 25 years, the business owners, the property owners, everybody paid for this plan. We taxed ourselves to get the Business Improvement District formed. Now, how many people tax themselves to advance the city? And then you have owners, like with this project, who have owned it for 10 years, and they want to develop the property, which is an improvement. 
Let's not go backwards. Let's move forwards. Do not let the city stagnate. Please approve this project. Move forward to the city of Thousand Oaks. That's why we have this specific plan. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Next up will be Kathy Goodspeed, followed by Tater Scott Champagne. Commissioners and members and staff, the constant application from out-of-town developers to change the face of Thousand Oaks is most disturbing. This city has basically ignored the citizens and voters in allowing the ongoing decision to increase high density, change zoning, zoning, and remove oak trees. The new Los Feliz project, which this commission recommended, will create major traffic problems and increase the level of crime in the area. With respect to the business owners, this specific plan is a great business plan, but it is a lousy community plan. Please do not let this continue. The people on Los Feliz cannot even walk after dark because of the crime. Please pay attention to the citizens and not the out-of-town greedy developers. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions for our speaker? Nope. Next up, Taylor Scott Champagne, and he will be our final speaker. Hello. My name is Taylor Scott Champagne. I live here in Thousand Oaks. What I have to say is short. Uh, my family owns several parcels along the boulevard that fall within the stretch affected by the specific plan. And as boulevard property owners, we'd like to voice our overall support for this project and commend the developer for presenting a project that we believe to be both visu visually appealing and environmentally sensitive. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to take just a minute to thank everyone for coming down and filling out either a speaker card or a written card. We on the commission appreciate it very much. Um, there is a lady, I think, that filled out the blue card where she wanted to speak. Absolutely. Just change the color. That's what I thought. That's why I asked for the cards back, because I thought she wanted to speak, and I saw that. Miss Edwards, I have a white card with your name on it. <laughs> so for the record, your name, city of residence, thank My you. My name is Joan Edwards, and I live in Westlake Village, um, California. And I'm going to first just read something that, was, that I read in the ACORN the other day, and also on a Facebook page, and also at the city council debate, I heard this said um, by Andy Fox. We're not going to compromise on the oak tree ordinance. It has served the city well. So removal of oak trees, unless it's impossible to use the property, we're not going to do that. Don't worry. We are going to take care of our trees, Andy Fox. Um, so I feel like this has been a promise, and then the opposite is going to happen here, I'm afraid. So I'm honored to stand here <clears throat> before you to speak in favor of some of the trees that I went to see up on Clay Court. Lots of different kinds of trees. Pine trees, fir trees, uh, olive trees, many, many kinds of trees. Lots of pepper trees. Pepper trees, I think, and lots of big eucalyptus trees that were first planted here when the city first started out, or before the city first started out, when we used to have the El Camino Real running through our town. And then the Ventura uh, Highway came, and Thousand Oaks Boulevard, and you could drive through. I can just imagine this little hill by the El Camino Real and then Ventura Boulevard and then Thousand Oaks Boulevard before it became 101. And the people who lived up on this hill probably had the uh, lower land saved for the lambs, uh, the sheep, and the cattle. And up on the side of the hill, they had this little 
hill and they planted all kinds of trees. Well, now you go up there and there's cactuses dying. The trees look bad. They really do look bad. They look sick. They look like they haven't been cared, to, cared for at all. Uh, there's a lot of toyones up there and like I said, lots of pepper trees. And what I'm afraid of is that this is going to be the Regency Plaza all over again, the deja vu all over again thing happening. You're going to go up there and, okay, some of the oak trees are going to be saved, and one of the toyons is going to be saved, but I can just hear the chainsaws going right now. Just mass destruction of all those trees up there so that these townhouses can be built. I can see the point in wanting more people walking in our streets. I think that that would be a good thing. But I'm hoping that if we have to build 26 townhouses that we can build around the trees that are there as much as possible. I, I think when I just see four huge big buildings and lots of parking in front, I don't see any way of trying to build around the trees from the plans that I see drawn by the, real, the architect. So if you have to build, please build around the trees. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Any questions from our speaker? Thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to staff now for possibly some input on some of the citizen questions. Ms. Pedrosa. Yes, we're going to start with uh, Rick Burgess answering some of the questions, and then we move on to Mr. Fatemi, and then he'll come back to me. Thank you, Ms. Pedroso. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd just uh, basically quickly discuss the issue of the trees because there is some confusion about how many trees there are. Uh, basically, there are 48 trees on or adjacent to the site. Six of those are toyons and 42 are oaks. And the nine oak trees um, that are off-site are within 100 feet of the property line. And consequently, we always survey trees that are close to the property line. That's why those were included. Um, the other thing is that anybody who's familiar with the um, Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan knows that the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is written into the plan, so we will have to comply with that. Um, that means that any um, work on the site, including grading, moving trees, whatever, that occurs between February 1st and August 15th, we'll have to do a breeding bird survey. If there are young birds found in a nest on, on that site, um, we have to keep a buffer area of 300 feet until the nest is, until the young are fledged. And so that's written into the project in general. Anything on the boulevard that um, would affect those kinds of uh, resources, we'll have to do that. Good evening. I'm Mohammed Fatemi, Engineering Division Manager for Top Public Works. Uh, there were a few issues brought up. Uh, again, uh, septic system uh, on the old house was brought up. It is added to the conditions of the project uh, to be removed properly. Uh, other issue was widening of the easement and the question about the right-of-way width. The right-of-way actually is not just one driveway to the property, but actually there are two different driveways on two sides of the channel and the channel itself. The width of the right-of-way actually is as wide as where the oak tree is at the bottom, closer to Thousand Oaks Boulevard. Uh, with uh, two streets and a median in between. It's the same width goes all the way to uh, Highway 101. So the proper width is available for future improvements if the, if the need be. As far as the street parking goes that came about, the Jensen Court it will be widened enough to would accommodate for parking on the street as long as it's legally parked there. And uh, another issue came about was watershed and dirt removal, also recharging the groundwater. The city of Thousand Oaks is actively involved with the statewide water quality issues. And MS4 permits, MPDES permits, we are one of the leaders in the county, and our county is one of the leaders statewide, actually the Southern California at least. And uh, we've been uh, controlling all sort of pollutions and sediments getting into the storm drain system and channels. Um, the watershed, the dirt removal has very little effect into the watershed. Uh, charging to the 
groundwater it has to be done very careful and planned properly because the water going into the ground might come out in somebody else's neighbor's uh, backyard, which we don't want. So it has to be planned properly. And also this project has a proposal, tentative proposal of recharging some of the stormwater back to the ground by a dry well they're installing there, which it may or may not be feasible to be done. And that would be determined at the time of plan checking. I believe these are the, all the public works issues. Thank you, Mr. Fatemi. Um, the only additional items that I wanted to bring up is in regards to the eucalyptus trees or the other oak trees that are proposed to be planted. Uh, we had said at the last hearing that, uh, that staff would work with the applicant in regards to uh, during the landscape plan check review to address those items. Uh, however, the commission would, if wants to entertain a condition, you know, that's another way that we're gonna um, go about it, except for, like I said, we had a talk uh, with the applicant and they're open to address those issues. Um, there was a comment made a couple of times on a village design where you avoid uh, trees. Uh, actually, that was one of the earlier design that the applicant proposed to us and actually that had a lot more impacts on the trees. Uh, the, what they came up at the end was a reduction of the impact. Um, part of it, and the commission doesn't get a chance to review the early stages of the designs, but part of it had to do with um, access to the, to the different parts of buildings, involves fire department requirements, turnarounds, you need also to have wider driveways and so on and so forth, and by the time you end up with that, you end up wiping out more of the site than what they have right now. To basically concentrate all the design on the upper part of the project and left the bottom part uh, untouched. Um, in addition to some of the concerns with parking, um, the project meets the parking requirements for the specific plan. Uh, that's on a specific plan and actually exceeds the requirements. And I'm looking at my notes over here. We addressed uh, drainage and septic tanks and the fencing as well uh, already. And, uh, and like I mentioned earlier, some of the trees that are coming out had to do with the widening of the Jensen Court, which no matter what development will happen on that property would happen um, at any rate. So if you have any further questions, we're available. Mr. Newman, you have a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Pedroso, um, you mentioned a moment ago that in the early planning stages there was a configuration that was a sort of village configuration. Is that one of the, the plans shown in, this, in the pamphlet that was handed out at the earlier meeting and tonight? I don't have the specific pamphlet in front of me. Uh, I did see on the PowerPoint Oh, I guess I can have one right now. <laughs> Thank you. It's about halfway through the booklet. Okay. It's labeled collaborative design process. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if we necessarily saw the very first one, the the one from 11.4. I think we might have seen the second one, I think, from 11.7. Is that the one you're referring to as a village configuration? We had one that they had more broken down buildings. Actually, I'm thinking... Uh, you know, I, I did not bring the pre-application file. Actually, I think the one that is more is the third one, where you have more of duplex and, and triplex buildings versus larger buildings, and they're throughout the property. All right, so when you said that, that a village-type configuration yeah. was considered, it, it's, it's this 1114 diagram you're referring it, it's to. It's something like that. It kind of it looks familiar, the one All from right. 1114, yeah. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Nichols. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, clarification again on, on parcel U, the right of way. I'm still a bit confused here. Um, is that a public right of way? Because I've heard some terms referred to, referred to as ownership, as to easement. Is this a public right of way as any other public right of way in the city where it's, it's under the control of the city of Thousand Oaks? It is not uh, the same 
uh, fashion of any other right of way, but for all practical purposes, it is acting as a public right of way. Correct. It's, uh, it has been dedicated to the city for the maintenance and installations of infrastructure within that area, including all the other streets in Thousand Oaks Track. It's very similar to Jensen Court ownership. It's very similar to the other part of the Clay Court ownership. It has the same situation. It is underlining ownership is not the city or anybody in the neighborhood, but the city has all the rights of using for public over that whole property. Is there a single underlying ownership? Sure, yes. Is it private ownership? Yes. And none of the parties involved in this? Then? No. The originally, when the track was recorded, the streets were created as individual parcels. When that happens, the original developer or some other ownership would have had the ownership of that parcel. Later on, through the district created for utility district in the area, they gave the rights to the city for maintenance and in construction of uh, public infrastructure. And that gave us the right for public use. Okay. And as far as the width, you mentioned that it's as wide as the two driveways. So were we, were we talking maybe, what, 50, 60 feet wide, or do you know the exact I width? I don't know exactly how wide it is, but it's the similar, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's the same width that we have in Clay Court where the median is with the tree in it. So it's pretty wide. It's easy to put at least uh, four lanes in that whole right away. If properly done, designed and is constructed, and if we want to spend the money, okay, it's just so then, costly to build. And the uh, this stream channel with the trees in the middle, that's still within that right of way, and, and the city ultimately has the the uh, rights to do whatever needs to be done in that area. Sure. Yes. Okay. It has the two sides of the driving area, including the channel in between. Okay. Um, and then going to the tree issue again, with these nine trees that are actually in this right-of-way area, is it appropriate to consider these nine trees as on the property or when we're talking about the number of trees to be addressed, should those be eliminated from the discussion? They, it would not be proper to eliminate them from the discussion because as, as Mr. Burgess had said earlier, um, whenever development is going to occur within 100 feet of an oak tree, we require a report. Um, sometimes the report will show that the oak or landmark tree is not going to be impacted. Uh, therefore, it's not part of the permit, but it's part of the report. Um, I, I would say that no one was consciously doing a numbers game here, if that's, if that's what you're, you're heading towards. Um, they are off-property trees, which are very, very often <clears throat> parts of uh, reports and parts of uh, permits. Uh, yeah, I, I was just trying to clarify. I think because this whole parcel U issue has been a little bit cloudy, I think a lot of us have been confused with that. Um, but now that I have a little bit better picture of that, uh, with the total now being reduced by nine, do you typically look at this type of situation where they define how many trees on site and then how many trees adjacent that might be affected, but they define those as off site so, so we can make a fair assessment as to what is truly under the ownership and under, the, under their uh, direct control? They are, they are clearly off property. Um, we do not uh, make any distinction between that. In fact, uh, very often there are off property trees that are being uh, impacted by a particular development. And if that's the case, then the, uh, the applicant has to get permission from that property owner. We had a situation exactly like that on this property on uh, one of their, their earlier plans 
and that's the, the tree, I believe it's number 11, the most uh, southerly tree there on, on, your, on your map. Um, the, the original grading was going to uh, remove that tree or severely impact it where we said, well, that's, that's a removal. We had them change the, the development in that area so that that tree could be preserved and all of the work outside of the, uh, the protected zone. So that's what we look at on each case is what they've presented, are there ways that we can make uh, minor changes to that, uh, move a building, eliminate a parking space. In this particular case, it was adjusting the grading to preserve that tree, which we did on, uh, on two other trees also. I believe it was 26 and 27, where they had, uh, in fact, the engineer had said that they were going to be trees that were going to be preserved, but then when uh, we received the report and walked the site and did our analysis, we said, well, not really. The, the amount of impact that you have there, those are, those are removals. So uh, sent the engineer back to his office and, and uh, they came up <clears throat> with a design that will truly uh, preserve those trees. So that's what we look at on a, on a tree by tree basis. There are some things <clears throat> that we can move around a bit and uh, and preserve the trees. There are others, like where you're widening Jensen Court, where there's, there's no alternative. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Pedros, I have a question for you, and this has to do with the broken down gates on the western slope. Uh, walking the property twice, it looks like a, a safety issue. Some kid would climb up there, climb around on them. Uh, what's the game plan for those gates? My understanding is that the applicant wants to leave the pillars uh, as they are right now. Okay, that's the pillars. Attached to the pillars are metal gates that look like they haven't worked for about 30 years. Yeah. So let's rephrase the question, the gates, not necessarily the pillars. That'll be a separate question, but the gates itself that are attached to the pillars. Okay, my understanding that basically the whole, imp they're going to leave everything the way it is from asking the applicant. And does staff have any concern about safety issues with the pillars, the fact that there's no fence and there's broken down gates? Well, right now, the, also the applicant's gonna be providing a new fence. Uh, at any rate, if the commission wants us to uh, look into having their pillars and gates being removed, uh, that's something that we can definitely add into to our conditions of approval. Thank you, any other questions for commissioners? Mr. Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Pedrosa, I had one more question. Uh, in the report, you indicated, that this, this is in reference to private open space, and you indicated that the, the city typically requires 400 square feet per, per unit. Is that just a policy, or is that a, a guideline? Because you also mentioned that some of these are, are less than that, about 300, that you were recommending that they provide at least a minimum of 300. So I'm just wondering, is that just a, a general recommendation, or is that a, a requirement uh, that's, that we hold fast to? Yeah, the, uh, that's a great question. The private open space requirement is actually not a requirement, it's a guideline, it's a design guideline. And um, for projects of this density, the, basically the planning commission makes, uh, determines what size those private sp open spaces need to be. As a matter of practice in the past, we have always tried to get the 400 square feet, whether it's uh, seven units or more. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's less or more. Uh, in some cases, you know, it becomes uh, uh, a little bit difficult to provide that because there's always some smaller, the interior units usually are a little bit harder to get. So we try to get the most area that we can. But again, since it's a guideline, it's not a waiver or deviation, it's just a guideline that we try to get it as, as much area as we can uh, in all projects. And if we can get the 400, that's what we try to do. And but there's been many projects throughout the years that have been approved with uh, less than 400 square feet uh, for the private open space. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioner questions? Okay, now we're going to go back to our applicant, uh, Mr. Everhart. You want to come back, make some final comments? You've got five minutes, and again, for the record, your name and city of residence. Yes, thank you again. Uh, just a couple comments on that. Uh, one, uh, we've tried from the very beginning to establish a, a new residence that will be not only visually appealing, but also uh, works within the current um, topography of the site, and that requires us to try as much as possible to limit the amount of, 
uh, grading that occurs, as well as to be able to mitigate the oak trees uh, and the landmark trees. You know, there's, there's things that uh, we've been asked to do in regards to the public improvements, that's that which is the widening of, of Jensen Court, and, uh, and then putting a sidewalk there, that which where there is none now, and it's really needed. Um, in fact, you know, when we talk, I think it was mentioned about the Toyons, you know, unfortunately, where the current, if we, if we widen the current street, three of those Toyons are right there. So we have to remove those Toyons, and then there was another one that, that we're able to, re, to relocate. But we've really worked very hard to, with the city with their experts, with our experts, to try to come up with just the plan that works here. I know that they keeps referring to this high density. We're not high density at all, um, not even close. And uh, you know, with the people that are currently living there, the you know, with the houses, you have to drive up that big slope, um, and that's that happens all the time. And people driving down. As Mr. Tuttle's area there, there's people driving down there. It's far from a quiet area. People are there all the time. However, with this new development, that's going to stop. You know, the, we, we had planned to put homes at the bottom, you know, along the area which is parcel U. And I think that's kind of where we got pulled, we, we added the extra trees because, again, that's what we were thinking. But then after working with staff, it was like, no, let's, let's, let's pull back from that. You know, let's put it up there where basically most of the area is already taken care of anyway in regards to just open space. And then let's, let's work within that to come up with a successful plan, which we have. Um, you know, the, 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 the mention about crime, everybody, that's, that's something everybody should be concerned about. But the way that you eliminate crime is you bring homeowners in and you bring people that are vested in the community, that care about the community. We'll have an HOA in place that's dedicated to protect, maintain, and enhance this property. And what they do is, is they make sure that these trees that, that currently are in all sorts of um, uh, areas of health and that sort of thing, they maintain those trees. They trim those trees. They make sure that everything looks good. Um, we're, we have uh, uh, all of our neighbors, all of our neighbors that surround us are supportive of this project. Um, I'm sure that if, if businesses were here, more businesses were here, they would stand up in line and say, you know, we've got payroll to make. We've got, we, we want to stay in business. We want to grow. Um, we don't want another vacancy next to us um, because it just, again, the more people that leave a particular area, it very, very quickly becomes, hey, we don't want to go shopping down there because there's, there's no, um, no choices. All the choices are gone. And so, you know, as they say, the, the areas that what does come in is the people that, that you really don't, you know, the uses that aren't favorable to a downtown. But that happens because people have to pay their rent. They have to get in those tenants. So I think that in, in closing, I'd like to say that what we're going to create with this development is one, a pristine new development that where people will definitely walk down and enjoy the, um, what's going on in Thousand Oaks. That in itself will re-energize and bring new businesses to the, to the downtown. And then in addition to that, we actually are creating a woodland. We're actually creating that pristine thing that everybody seems to be talking about um, because nobody is going to be going down that slope. Nobody's going to be there. Uh, I mean, should you wish to condition me to push the, the uh, fence up higher, I can do that. But the reason that we had it down lower and, and that decision was made is so that people aren't going up that slope. The trees are left alone. But, um, you know, we're, we're willing to do that. Again, um, it's, it's a substantial investment um, on our part to not only uh, to do the, the public works par portion of it, but actually to, to move the trees around. We took the time, didn't cut corners. We brought the right experts in, and the experts now agree. And so, you know, we've worked within the rules. We've listened to everyone. Uh, we've worked hard. We, we had, as you can see, I, we had more, more, more site plans than this. But we all worked to, together to come to this particular uh, site plan. And then everybody feels confident. Everybody feels good. You're going to bring the right people. Again, the, the, this development will do the right things for this city. Again, it's, you're looking at, you're at, a, you're at a, a point where you can look at it, you, it's, it's where does this vision go? 
how does this city get renewed? How, how do you keep things going? So thank you again with great respect. Um, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Everard. Do you have any questions for applicant? Mr. Trapel. Actually, Everhart, right? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Everhart, thanks. There's a couple of things I'm just going through here because it's, it's you know, it's, it's going through deja vu again, if you know what I'm talking about. And I'm taking a look at a couple of little things that came up. And I'm not going to, I have a feeling some of the things uh, Commissioner Nichols may be bringing up. We talked about the fence. That's not an issue. The gate pillars, the pillars and the gates, I can't believe that's going to be an issue if that came up as a, as a problem. The only other thing is the, um, the addendum, the attachment that we got in from, shoot, law offices of Jeffrey Marcus, uh, I guess representing the Tuttles, um, to preserve oak trees on clay court to facilitate fire truck access would be a condition the applicant dedicate a five-foot easement at the bottom of the western slope for the benefit of clay court. Is that an issue? I mean, you're going to be grading up there anywhere. Is that, is that really a big issue? No, it's not. But again, the reason that, that we didn't want to touch the, the fence or the wall was the fact that we didn't want to bother any of the oaks or, the, or that area. That, uh, but we're good, we're, because if, if, but if you're talking about the widening, he's talking about the widening basically that will knock down that wall. And, but you're going to put up a fence there. And, and encroach in there. We were going to leave the wall, but, you know, we can, okay, I'm we confused. can petition to change that. Can, I, well, I need to be educated here then, because I thought we had a last time um, staff, we talked about the, and it's actually in the front of our report here, provide fencing on the western side of the property. Is that before or after the wall then? Um, that would be basically, the, the wall is basically on the PL, and so that would be, we would just be behind it. Oh, I see what you're doing. All right, I have no further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Nichols. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Everhart, uh, uh, Commissioner Newman mentioned uh, his concern, which I echoed as well, regarding the number of parking spaces per unit, which I understand that you are following within the specific plan guidelines. But as I was rereading the uh, project information this afternoon, um, I noticed that you have 14 units that are four bedrooms, and those all you have either three and a half or four bathrooms, and the smallest is 1,872 square feet. So these are pretty good sized townhomes. I, I have real concerns over one and three quarters parking spaces being sufficient for a four bedroom, four bath townhome. Um, would you entertain reducing the number of four bedrooms and increasing the number of three bedroom units? I guess the, one of the things is that uh, to answer your question is we try to develop a product that actually fit within the current zoning. Uh, and so that was where that was where we were coming from on that. If you're asking, can a bedroom be changed into a, a den or something like that, um, we could definitely look at that. Um, but again, we do exceed the parking requirement for the, for this particular plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, I understand that it's is within the guidelines. Um, yeah. And uh, again, it, it, it just as we're trying to mull this in, around, it just it seems like it's a little bit much for, uh, for that size, you know, but I just had to ask the question, so thank you. I have a question for you. I usually have all my great questions asked before me, but I have one. Public safety, all right? So I'll have a little dialogue with you about the pillars. I was up there yesterday. And if you go back to when you were maybe eight or 10 years old and you're playing in someone's backyard or on the hill, you always try to make stuff out of something. And so right now we've got about four foot or five foot pillars sticking up. I'm thinking, what would an eight year old kid do with that pillar? So my question is, what's the benefit of keeping pillars there that no longer serve a road because the house has been torn down? What, in addition to the metal that's attached to the pillar, but just look at the whole apparatus. Yeah. Why would you want to keep it? Well, uh, let me answer that two ways. One is that um, we looked at not taking down the pillars. It's not because of cost, but it's because we didn't want to do anything that have people around, equipment around that would be jeopardizing any of those trees that are right next to, or right next to that wall. However, 
the flip side of that is that, um, again, this property will be protect, maintained, enhanced by an HOA. So the HOA has liability should some, so some child have an issue. So we'll go out there and take a look. If there's issues with that, then we'll take it down. Uh, I'm actually looking a little bit farther in because I'm actually uh, president of the homeowners association. So I think of safety. That's number one. I have safety in a property. We do building inspections and have audits from insurance companies to tell us that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem. Now, being an adjuster, I can't tell you specifically how much of a problem it is, but just using common sense, I walk by and I say, that's an issue and that's a problem that I really don't want to have to wait for the homeowners association to figure out whether it's a problem or not. I'd like to make it a condition. So my question to you, if I made it or suggested to the commission that those pillars be removed for safety reasons, how would you respond to that? We would have no issue with that. It's, it's the gates, it's the metal gates that are broken the gates, and rusted, the pillars, it's the pillars. The entire fence. I don't want anything that an eight or 10 year old kid's gonna be playing around thinking, oh, I'm just gonna jump off the pillars and have some of those 26 new families responsible because they didn't know all the technicalities. That's, that's our responsibility to look at that. So I'm looking at it in advance saying, that's a safety issue and I want it out. Excellent We're point cool with that? and right. we would have no problem to all that right. condition. Any other questions I, from commissioners? I, yes, Commissioner Reynolds. But those pillars and that gate is on the back side of the fence, though, also, isn't it? So you can't get to that area from the project. You'd have to go down on Clay Court. Well, there'd be two ways. It would be a, a usually an eight-year-old boy going down from the project down the hill to find the pillars, because that's where they're going to want to get away from their family to out, go out and play, or come up through Clay Court. Either way, you got two different access points. And little girls would probably think of that, too. <laughs> yeah, as well as old uh, Planning Commission chairmen, they'd have that problem, too. So I have one of each, and I would agree with both of those. <laughs> yes, Mr. Town. Um, thank you. Um, while Mr. Everhart is, is, uh, is before his rebuttal, I just wanted to uh, touch again on the concept that Commissioner Nichols raised about uh, the slope down below and that being a a public exterior space. The, uh, the specific plan, although it has some introductory language about public spaces, um, one statement, and I'm looking at uh, page 79 of the plan, mentions that they should serve um, and serve to establish a sense of place and identity and provide space for private outdoor dining events and street side entertainment. So I mentioned that and also be, elsewhere in the plan there's a 3% requirement for such spaces to be dedicated as part of multifamily and commercial projects. So the section that we discussed earlier, while it says it applies to all properties within the plan, the intent, I think, was to have these spaces along the boulevard. So I just say that now because if the commission is entertaining any, any potential condition that would affect the applicant, then now's the time, of course, to raise that. So I wanted to be clear on that. And then just also in terms of the uh, letters from uh, Mr. Marcus and the uh, comments from Mr. Tuttle, just to remind the commission that staff did address a no all of those obviously have been provided to the commission, but staff did address a number of those on pages uh, 74 and 75 of tonight's packet. That was included in your previous packet. And we have already stated in this response that as far as the issues related to landscape go, that is obviously preserving the oaks on the lower slope, not planting new oak trees too close to the driveway to Mr. Tuttle's property, um, and providing landscaping for privacy purposes between 102 Clay Court and the subject property. We've already gone on record saying that we would support those as part of our landscape plan review. If the commission feels that those need to be more specific in terms of changes to our conditions of approval, Staff would be happy to entertain that, but we're already on record as supporting those changes. Any other? Mr. Nichols. Uh, well, Mr. Everard is still here. Uh, I noticed that there's really no amenities like pool, spa, community room, a gym type of thing where uh, you're typically where you have a, a millennial type of uh, clientele they usually have those type of amenities. Was that intentional or is it just a space issue? Well, sometimes they have them and sometimes they don't. Um, a lot of the developments that are, um, that have access to, in, in this case, we have access to the downtown 
Um, that's a great amenity. We consider that an amenity. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's an area where we've worked, uh, again, with, with uh, city staff to try to um, make something that's more adult-oriented type of an amenity. And actually, when you look at what our um, landscape architect has designed in regards to the area where you can actually sit and look over and have a nice view, uh, it's been, it'll be phenomenal. Um, the way that it's been designed so that you, there's, a, there's a creative area where, where people can sit out and can you know, do their computers, they can talk, they can all do all those things. That's what we have. Okay, thank you. Any final commissioner questions for our applicant? Okay. This is also the time, and by the way, thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. You can go ahead and sit down now. Um, before I close the public hearing, I want to see if there was any other issues that you wanted to either run by the applicant, any potential conditions, things that you want clarity on, either from staff or the applicant. Commissioner Turpel. Yes, just real quick, Mr. Burgess, um, I'd, just to get back on the record, um, because I know it kind of went, it flew by real quick when you were talking about, when we we're talking about trees and, and the life, uh, the bird life or the wildlife there, what, what process do you go through with that again? It would uh, basically be a breeding bird survey if there's any work that's going to be done within a certain time of year, and that would be February through um, August or so. Uh, when birds are breeding, if birds you know, are, if nests are found, um, then they have to keep a buffer area between any work that goes on on the site and the uh, nesting birds until they fledge. And is there is there something in place that you know that that after the development happens that it's recreated for that wildlife to return? Uh, excuse me, to to return to that particular area, or do you do you look at that? Or I'm, that's just, this is the first time I've ever heard you talk about doing this. So, <laughs> well, you know. Um, I don't think there's any specific requirement of that nature, but basically because there are going to be a lot of, there's going to be a very dense woodland below the site and most of those species would be able to exist there as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, uh, I wanted, if you wanted to entertain the language for the pilaster and gates, if that's one condition you wanted to add, we have a suggested language. Uh, the applicant shall remove the existing pillars and gates located at the southwestern end of the property. The site plan and grading plan shall be revised and submitted for review and approval by the Community Development Department. Let me confer with my attorney next door. <laughs> That's specific enough, yes. Thank you, Ms. Pedrosa. All right, if there's no other question. Oh, Mr. Chair, could I just add to that since we've had a lot of discussion about the rock wall and yet its, its demise is yet to be determined that we include that the rock walls be retained? I would be open to yes, because we were talking about the pillars, not the gate. Correct. Or excuse me, not the fence. It took the, to, but to, but to retain the, because uh, I think there is some whether it be 30 or 50 or some historical nature that I think would be nice to preserve that. I, okay. I, I, I thought I didn't mean to step on you, but I thought Mr. Mr. Everhart Nichols said he was going to do Let's that. do this. Rather than going through pieces, let me just kind of get a flavor of, you know, Commissioner Trapel, in terms of retaining. No, I, I have no problem with that okay. at all. A natural looking yep. wall. Natural looking. Yeah. Yes. Natural okay. looking wall. Yep, absolutely. Well, that was easy. All right. So, yes. Uh, let's include, if we could, please. I don't know if we need two people to uh, include that language or we're just going to rely on to include. Uh, Ms. Pedrosa, could you like to reword that to include maintaining the natural stone fence? Yes, so I can, uh, do you, do you, would you like me to reread it, including the language? Okay. Sure. So the applicant shall remove the existing pillars and gates located in the southwestern end of the property, and ret uh, but re um, I guess but retain the existing stone wall um, uh, at its current location, and then we can set the site plan and drainage and grading plan shall be revised uh, and submitted for review and approval by Community Development Department. So we can probably massage the language a little bit. We're on the same page, right? We're good. Yep. Okay. We could have nodded the head from our applicant rather than coming up. Okay. You okay. All right. Any other questions or comments before we close the public hearing? All right, the public hearing is now closed. Commission discussion. Would Commissioner, you want to say something or what? 
<laughs> Commissioner Trupel, you did such a fine job at the last hearing. I'm going to do it. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Commission. I'd like to recommend that the Planning Commission approve NEG Deck 2014-70234, tentative track map 2014-70162, Development Permit 2014-70161, OTP 2014-70165, and, and LTP 2014-70226, based on the following findings and subject to the attached conditions, as well as staff's recommendation to the conditions, as stated this evening. Does that work? That was one of the longer ones, but yes, thank you. Commission discussion. Commissioner Nichols. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if you recall, as we were ending our last meeting, uh, Mr. Chair, you, you asked me what it would take for me to be able to approve this project. So I've had a couple weeks to think about it. Um, not much has changed, but on these, I'll, I'll, I'll share my thoughts. Uh, as we're, as we're on our, our, in our 50th anniversary, we're looking to the past as well as to our future. As I've been reading through, which I did cover to cover, the Thousand Oaks Boulevard plan, specific plan, in reference to this project, I was trying to get a bead of what the city council has laid before us as far as what that vision is going to be and how this project fits into that. Uh, what I concluded was that most of the projects are having to deal with frontage on Thousand Oaks Boulevard, and this project does not, which makes it unique. Uh, perhaps there are others, but I don't think there's that many more that, that are not fronting CO Boulevard. Likewise, uh, there are not many projects that have this, or, or parcels within this specific plan that have this number of oak trees on them. So I think this is a very unique site uh, that we're having to contend with in dealing with this project. And as I mentioned before, I, uh, you know, I saw that this project was, to me, it looks like you have a project and you're just trying to you know, find the best place for it and just eliminating the soil and the trees that are in the way to make it work. Uh, and I, but I, I kind of see this site as, as like typical of old Thousand Oaks. You know, yeah, this kind of got some funky houses out there, um, but that's what old Thousand Oaks is about. And that, that's the character of our community. To, to me, I see that site as representative of the character of the community. And to see that modified, I struggle with that because it, to me, I, I like history and I like the, the character that has developed Thousand Oaks as to what we have and who we are. And so I see that moving aside as a result of this project. So that, that concerns me. Uh, I, I still don't think that the site, that the project is that sensitive to the site or the environment because of the amount of soil that's being removed and the amount of uh, trees being removed. I mean, we have 14,700 cubic yards of, of soil leaving the site in 1,028 truck trips. I thought it was 22 of 42 trees being impacted, but apparently it's 22 of 36 trees being impacted. So over 60% of the oak trees are impacted. Four of the six or 67% of the landmark trees are impacted. Uh, again, I don't think that's environmentally sensitive for this site. And bear with me, I, I have a forestry background, so I like to think in resource management issues. Uh, while Mr. Burgess and I would concur, the site is disturbed. However, it retains its native soil, its natural slopes, and an existing native stand of trees. And as I looked at the stand of trees, we have 27 trees that are within two to 10 inches in diameter. And what that tells me is we have a naturally regenerating stand of oak trees here. People didn't plant those trees to become two inches. They naturally regenerated. We also have trees nearby off-site, I've come to find out, they're 38 inches in diameter. So we have a very wide range of trees here. To me, it's a natural habitat that's regenerating and actively regenerating, despite the activities taking place up there. Now, fortunately, uh, the smaller trees can be transplanted. I, I still question whether a 28-inch tree will successfully be transplanted here. I've, witnessed many transplants, and at best they survive, they rarely thrive. Um, I, I also believe, as I just briefly mentioned, that the number of four bedroom units and the limited parking that's available, and unfortunately the way that our specific plan is written that allows it, I struggle with that, and however it fits with the a, with a, with a policy. Um, 
So I, I still think that the parking will continue to be an issue. So because of those concerns, I, I still, unfortunately, I cannot support the project. So I understand and I, uh, I appreciate the specific plan, but I don't think it anticipated this type of a project on this type of a site. It's mostly with the, with the businesses on the boulevard. This is a unique site, and I think it's a little too uh, overdeveloped and still needs to resort back to a village. If you can't get 26 units in a village design, then maybe there needs to be fewer units. Commissioner Reynolds? Um, you know that I'm very strong believer in property rights, and also I believe that people should have the reasonable use of their property. In fact, I think we're almost bound to that that we must give them reasonable use of the property. And everyone questions and says, oh no, don't cut down another oak tree. But I wonder how many were cut down for their own home. And I, that isn't a nice statement to make, but I'm really concerned about that. I know when we built our house, because it is a custom home, that we did not take down any oak trees. Uh, we displaced a lot of ground squirrels. But um, I see that, and as Commissioner uh, Nichols was just speaking about the trees regenerating themselves, well, that's going to happen after this project's complete. If it's happening now, the trees that are there and the new trees that will be transplanted, they will regenerate. I have, even though I don't have oak tree, an oak tree on my property, we find tiny little ones at times on the properties because the birds, the crows, and whatever carry the acorns and drop them. Um, I was really excited about the Boulevard plan, and I'm pleased to see this project come through and support that Boulevard plan. Now, I have children that aren't quite millennials, they're a little bit older, but I know that young people like to live where they can walk, and I'm sure that that Italian restaurant's gonna love if this project goes through. And all of them, Dalen is another one that I think we approve music at. It's down not too far uh, from the project. Um, I'm always concerned about oak trees just as much as the other person, but I do know that there are over 55,000 oak trees and thousand oaks right now. And I'm not, not saying just because there are that many trees that we should start cutting them down. I did support that oak tree ordinance, but when, when the planning commission saw it, it was for residential only. It wasn't for commercial properties to go and cut down the oak trees. That we felt that if someone had planted a, a not, let's say, if there was a non-native oak tree on the property, that they had the right to remove that tree. Um, I don't think this is a high density project. I worry about the speeders coming up the street and making a left turn, but I think once it's widened, that's going to make, be a big improvement to the area. And there are medical buildings up at the end, because I used to go and have x-rays in those buildings at the very end. And even this afternoon, there was still traffic going up there. I like that they're leaving the bottom part in a more natural. They, they, there's never been talk, even when I sat and watched your first meeting, there was never a talk of cleaning up that area down below. And I like that. I like that the walls being left. It's too bad that if they take the pilasters out when they, if, and that they don't continue the wall and just make it a continuous one because now it's going to have some gaps in it. Um, I'm in support of the motion for this project. I'm going to support it. I think that uh, the property has stayed vacant for a long time, that uh, the people that own it have the right to develop this property. I think it's a good plan, and especially looking at all the other plans that they had worked on, that I don't think that they've done this as a quick fix to the property. I think that it's been well thought out and well designed, and I know that they'll be successful in transplanting the trees because especially this company has been so successful in the past with, plant, re, um, with planting, re, um, transplanting trees. And also, I wanted to say it's not our job to decide what people do with these units. There could be a husband and wife. They could each have an office within it. Uh, it's nice when there are guests coming over to have more bathrooms than one or two also, 
but there is a problem with the parking, but there's a problem all over town. And I know they're concerned there's no tot lots, but I've been doing this for 10 years, and I can remember the first project I ever approved, and there was just a spa put on that property. There wasn't, the only time we really looked at a lot of tot lots is if it was the mini mansions or the area housing authority projects, because we knew there would probably be a lot of children going into those projects. Um, not that millennials don't have children, but uh, I just don't see the need for the tot lots. I like the idea of the 400 square foot, what a 20 by 20 uh, open space area. And I think that's something I remember from years and years ago, the city, and I've lived here almost 43 years, talking about how people living on top of each other, and that's why they recommend the patios and that square footage of some open space within the units so that we really aren't living on top of each other. And so I think it's a good thing in this plan. As I said before, I'm going to support the project. Commissioner Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, I, for the record, I too live on uh, land that had no oak trees before the house was put up. Um, we've heard a lot of numbers tonight um, and two weeks ago, and some of these numbers have turned out to be squishy numbers. Um, so I'd like to go through the various concerns I have and address those. Um, starting with the concept that millennials will be coming in and saving us and saving Thousand Oaks Boulevard. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal last month that reported that half of all millennials have a net worth of $10,400 or less. So if we're staking our future on the notion that 52 people with less than 10 grand in the bank are gonna save us, our economic troubles are more serious than I realized. On density, we've heard various claims about how many people will be in this project. Anywhere from two to, I think someone else said maybe there'd just be one person in these three or four bedroom apartments. Unfortunately, that while that's fanciful, it's a nice aspiration, um, it's low density, unfortunately, the data doesn't support that assertion. Nationally, there's something like 2.3 residents per housing unit. In Thousand Oaks, it's actually far denser than that. The city released an update to the housing element of the general plan last week, and based on the most recent data, in Thousand Oaks, there are 2.73 residents per housing unit. And by the way, that's for all housing units, including one bedroom and two bedroom. So the notion, again, that three or four bedroom units will have fewer than 2.73 doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We heard some talk tonight about children and about tot lots or playgrounds. I've visited this area several times. Um, I visited the closest park, which is on Moody Co Court, fronting uh, Thousand Oaks Boulevard. Um, neither of them have safe areas for kids to throw a ball around, play catch, maybe play on some playground equipment. Uh, the nearest place to do that is around a mile away and involves crossing a major thoroughfare, Thousand Oaks Boulevard. That's in contravention of our general plan, which says that we have safe nearby places for kids to play. It's not safe to cross a major boulevard to do that. And that also brings us to the traffic question. I've visited this site several times, including today, and every single parking spot that was available on the street was taken every time I went. And these are places where there's medical buildings, there's automotive repair yards, they're having cars coming in and out all day long. So the notion that we're gonna somehow make things better by having a wider street just on Jensen there, but we're also adding 52 plus cars, and I doubt that it is 52, I think it'll be more. The notion that our traffic problems will get better, not worse, again, I, I have concern with that. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, we're also told by um, the applicant tonight that the noise problem would be irrelevant because there are new sound walls called going up at uh, the 23-101 intersection. And I certainly hope that it's true that the noise walls will abate the noise, 
but 70 decibels, which is the noise that is being presented to third floor residents in this proposal, 70 decibels is pretty loud. And if any of you doubt that, I'd be glad to borrow some public address equipment from Commissioner Turpel and play 70 decibel noise in, in your residence or your place of work for a couple of hours. And if you like living with that, you might reconsider your view of what's, uh, how livable 70 decibels is, abated or not. Even Mr. Everhart in his testimony said this evening, it's far from a quiet area. Yes, the abatement will help, but this is a pretty noisy place to put lots more new residents, possibly kids. It's a noisy place. And that brings us finally to the environmental issues we've been talking about tonight. And here again, the numbers are pretty squishy. We, we were told that there was um, maybe 40% of the trees were being reconfigured. Well, it turns out to be 60%, as Commissioner Nichols has noted, or more. While I certainly don't have the same expertise in the area of forestry, I have the same concerns about disturbing as much of the terrain there, and it is a pretty special area, um, disturbing as much of that as, as the application proposes to do. I'm, um, I'm also concerned about the numbers with regard to tree replacement or tree movement. Um, we're going from three to one, which is our policy, or one to three, rather, where if we chop down one tree, we, we replace it with three. Well, probably we're not going to be doing that. We're going to be closer to one to one, maybe, but we don't really know what that number is because even though we heard two weeks ago from the city that there would be enough room for, what, for the three tree replacement to work, Tonight we heard from the applicant that we don't have the proper room, that's a direct quote, and that the trees would be crammed in there for the sake of numbers. And that's, that's in general the concern I have with this proposal. We are cramming in there this project for the sake of numbers. And for that reason, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry that I cannot support this proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Always the last, but certainly not least. I, I appreciate everyone's feedback and opinion uh, to go over something twice with applicants and residents and staff. Tremendous amount of time and effort. So first of all, thank you for everybody for all the things that you've done for this case because it's been going on for a long time. Um, I try to take in all the information I possibly can and what keeps coming back to me is balance. When I say balance is that the city of Thousand Oaks for the last 50 years, possibly even before that, but certainly the last 50 years, they've done a great job with balancing things oak tree preservation, environmental issues, but still having places to live and places to work and places to play. I would match our city with any city in the United States. I've had the, I guess you'd call it the luxury of traveling a lot to visit some of these towns. And every time I come home, and every time I come down that 101 freeway, the first thing I say to myself is a big sigh. I'm glad to be home. Yeah, not every project is perfect. I guarantee you that. Every project's gonna have something that's upset somebody or doesn't quite fulfill all of the objectives. But if we keep, balance as the key, I think uh, that'll serve us well for the next 50 years. So I'm going to be uh, supporting of the motion um, that Mr. Tappel has made. And like at this point, yes, and this also includes the fence condition. Okay, you've got that? Yes, that's agreed. Yes. Okay. So with that. You're talking about the fence decision with the rock wall that Commissioner Nichols brought up. That's correct. That's correct and the fence condition from the previous meeting. So that's all, yes. All of that, right. Thank you very much. Please vote. Motion passed three to two with Commissioner Newman and Nichols opposed. As a reminder, there is a 10 day appeal process with the Community Development Department. With that, would the clerk please call case 6B. Hearing advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 6B regarding case SUP 2014-70263 and OTP 2013-70457. 
Applicant, Verizon Wireless. Request to allow the installation of a wireless communications facility consisting of antennas on a replacement street light and associated equipment in an underground vault and to allow encroachment within the protected zone of one oak tree. Location 190 Regal Oak Court. Good evening, Mr. Lynn. Will you be heading our project this evening? Good evening, Chair, Member of Planning Commission. Uh, for your second project this evening, there is an application for a, this is a combined two applications uh, located at 190 Regal Oak Court for a, for special use permit application 2014-70263 and Oak Tree permit application 2013-70457. The request is to allow a wireless commu communication facility consist of a radon on top of a replacement existing street light with all the equipments in the underground vault. Also for the Oak Tree permit application, the, re the replacement light standard is a, uh, will be encroaching into one existing Oak Tree. Uh, the encroachment will be both for the light standard and also the underground vault. Subject location is located at the southeast corner of Lane Road and Regal Oak Co uh, Court. Um, the, it is uh, to the south of Lane Road, uh, both to the east and west of Regal Oak Court are two open space, open spaces. The one on the, on the west is a open space consisting of approximately over five acres. The one on the east is approximately about eight acres. The Regal Oak Court leads to a tract home of approximately about 82 homes. Across from Lynn Road to the north is a church directly north of uh, Regal Oak Court. Um, and to the east is single family homes as well as to the west of Lynn Road. This is a view of uh, Lynn, Lynn Road looking from east uh, on the sidewalk. Um, the subject light standard is right in the middle of the photo. Um, this is another view from uh, looking west uh, from the sidewalk on the south of Lynn Road and the intersection to the in the middle of the photo is Regal Oak. This is another view uh, from Regal Oak uh, Court looking northeast. The light pole is not visible in this, from this photo as uh, the light pole is uh, behind the tree. As um, provided by uh, the applicant, the purpose of this application is to provide more reliable wireless and also capacity service to the vicinity of Lynn Road and the Roy, uh, Regal Oak area. This, the zoning uh, for this property is zoned OS open space. Um, it is zoned open space because it's adjacent to two open space to the south of the, the project. Um, our city code does require that uh, wireless facilities uh, we require a special use permit application for a, a zoning of open space. Applicant has uh, provided 13 alternative sites evaluated in this case, uh, primarily uh, along the commercial location, uh, the shopping consisting of shopping centers, school, hotels, and also a uh, a park. Along, Lin, uh, along Newberry Road. Uh, applicant also pr looked at several alternative analysis uh, along Lynn Road, uh, basically on uh, mostly street lights and utility poles. And that runs in between from East Kelly Road to Regal Oak Court. Staff also provided a alternative sites analysis to Planning Commission 
this evening, uh, earlier, uh, beginning of the Planning Commission hearing. And this is a, these are alternative um, propagation maps that's provided by the applicant. And this is also a, a view of uh, all the yellow pins are the alternate locations that applicant has uh, looked at. Uh, on the north of the, on the top of the page would be uh, all the commercial properties they have looked at. And along Lane Road uh, are the utility and the uh, light poles on the, to the south of the, the frame. Now, the applicant picked the, this final location is because it meets their coverage goals. It is also further from the residences and has good, it is accessible from the street. Um, any type of repairs could be parked on Regal Oak Court or along Lynn Road. It also offers a minimum visual impact. This is another site plan that's uh, showing on the, on the southeast location of uh, Lane Road and Regal Oak Court. Um, the proposed underground utilities would be to just to the east of the light pole and on the north of uh, the sidewalk area. The antenna design consists of a three antennas it will be uh, housed within a, a radome, a cylinder radome, consisting of approximately about 24 inches in diameter and a 5.5 high. The replacement light presently is at 30, 30 feet high. The, the new light will be 29 feet and with a radome of 5 foot 5, uh, making it a total of 35 feet high. The pole will be wider to house the, the, the cables and also for the structural purposes. Presently, the, the light pole is eight inches wide at the bottom and it tapers to about six inches to the top. Another elevation and section of the, the proposed light pole, uh, the, the depth of this underground vault will be approximately about 17 feet deep, uh, about 23 feet wide and about another seven and a half feet uh, depth. Again, the equipment will be housed under, uh, in an underground vault, and that includes that the, flood, the, the, mount, the vents will be flush mounted to the sidewalk. And this is a, uh, a, um, a further zoom in of the location of the underground vault. Now, staff does support uh, this project, based on that, it does not offer detrimental visual impact. The design involves a existing light pole re replacement of the same height. Um, the proposed antennas has been concealed in the radome, and also all the equipments, including the vents, are underground or flush to the ground. This is a view of the a, another view of the light being replaced looking southeast across from Lim Road. And this is a photo simulation provided by applicant with a radome on top of the new light pole. So another view looking east on Lim Road of the existing light pole. This would be a photo simulation of a new light pole being replaced. Here's another view from across Lim Road looking southwest the view of the a new pole with the radon. A technical aspect has been uh, evaluated by our city wireless facility uh, consultant from Kramer's office. Uh, trip here is from Kramer's office, is available for any type of questions. And the project does comply with FCC standard. There's also a, an application for encroachment within a protected zone of the oak tree for the, it is the oak tree application will be necessary because of the replacement of the light, which is within the protected zone of the oak tree, as well as the, the vault itself. Now, city's uh, oak tree consultant, Mr. Richard Campbell, is here available for any type of questions. He has evaluated the project. The 
project is exempt from CEQA. Staff recommends approval of SUP 2014-70263 and OTP 2013-70457 based on the recommended findings and subject to the conditions approved contained in the staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Lin. I appreciate it. Commissioner, questions for staff or Mr. Lin at this time? Mr. Newman, you know what, Mr. Newman, I'm going to turn to the right the next time to get your questions first because, how's that? <laughs> Mr. Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your even-handed approach. Good evening, and thank you for that presentation. Um, I could use, begin by using some clarification on the final condition. This is condition 26 on page 95. stating that the light standard is not a wireless tower or base station. Um, do you mean to say there, there is a wireless tower, but it's above the light standard, or there is no wireless tower here, or what, what, are, what are we saying in this condition? Good evening, Commissioner Newman, and welcome to the, uh, to the commission now. Thank you. I'd like to take the uh, question from staff, if you'd permit me. This condition is a standard condition that was written in before, uh, let's say, October 17th, when the, commission, the FCC released their order interpreting what's called Section 6409 of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act. That statute says that a local, state or local government shall approve and may not deny a permit request to co-locate or modify any existing wireless tower or base station so long as it doesn't substantially change the physical dimensions of that existing tower or base station. There wasn't a clear definition on what constituted a tower or a base station, and so in order to preserve local discretion over future expansions of the site, the condition was written in. On October 17th, the Commission voted unanimously to adopt interpretations. Those interpretations are not binding yet because they haven't been published in the Federal Register, and there's a 90-day tolling period, but we know now that this condition will be preempted under the commission's rules. All right, so so it's it's plausible that this would come out in the future and that we are indeed talking about a wireless uh, sorry, a wireless tower or base station here. Uh, very specifically we'd be talking about a base station. The way that the commission has interpreted a wireless tower is anything constructed solely for the purpose of supporting wireless antennas or their accessories. Right. This doesn't change this, the solar primary purpose as a light standard, but because there's wireless equipment attached to it, it takes on the definition of a base station. All right, but the scope of this project, just so I'm clear, um, encompasses a base station. There's some equipment that's buried underground, and there are some antennas uh, that both transmit and receive signals on top of a light standard encased in a radio, and there's a GPS antenna that receives GPS signals on top of that. Is that correct? That's correct. Great, thank you. Uh, just a couple other clarifications on page 89. Um, one with regard to grading, just in terms of connectivity to the existing plant. Uh, I think this is saying that, that the project would require the digging of a trench across Lynn Road, is that correct? To connect this to the existing network, is that right? Yeah, the the cabling uh, would be. It doesn't really require grading in this case. It'll be a tunneling through Lynn Road. So there's now open trenches. So there would be no no interruption of traffic or anything like that on Lynn Road. This no. would be underground. Yes. Is that correct? correct? Okay, great. Thank you. And then the final question I had for staff is regard to the oak tree. Um, 
And it says it's extremely unlikely to hit roots um, as part of the digging, and I understand that. But if, if roots were hit, what is plan B? What, what would happen if you did hit roots when you were digging? I'm on now. <laughs> uh, what we would do is we do an exploratory trench at the uh, limit of, of the uh, construction of that vault. And then we'd find out if there are any roots. The uh, fallback is we may have to move the vault. And that's in the report that the uh, applicants, Arborist, has put in. All right. Thanks very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Commissioner Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A point of clarification regarding the uh, vents that are being, or hatch and vents are being proposed. I know we've got an equestrian trail there, and there's like a little little transition where folks have to you know ride their horses on across the street, on the sidewalk, and then veer behind the fence. I just wanted to verify that there is nothing that would be either in that portion of the sidewalk or in that transition into the uh, DG trail that would uh, either cause a horse injury or that they would think they could step on something and come crashing through. Um, I'm just not quite sure where the location of it is. It, can you verify one way or the other that that either would or possibly could happen? Um, the applicant's proposing to have all types of above ground uh, structures to be flushed with grade. In this case, nothing would be um, extending out. And at the end of the trail, the, the reason uh, stuff that support this project is because everything that used to be, uh, sometimes the, app, the wireless facility may need to be above ground. In this case, applicant has proposed everything to be flushed on grade. So is there, since it is flush, there's going to be some type of a cover. Would, would that pathway that an equestrian would take, would they have to walk across the cover, or is it further down the sidewalk past the uh, railing? Um, the, there is some sort of a cover uh, for, for, for the ventilation. It'll be at the sidewalk area um, at the end of the trail. Is it? Well, I, I guess my, my main concern is, will it support the weight of a horse? Commissioner Nichols, uh, we don't know what the weight rating for the vent cover is uh, based on the materials in front of us, and maybe the applicant can answer what kind of materials they'll be used to construct the vent covers. Okay, we'll wait to hear that then. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Lynn. Normally when we have cell site installations, we uh, have a very extensive alternative site analysis with all the numbers that are relevant in this one. Certainly, we've got some pictures and some additional supplementals that came in our packet today. Is there any additional math, so to speak, or any other numbers that you might want to supply us as to the alternative sites that were considered? As Not that we don't take your opinion for being truthful, but part of our job is to ask the question because you do such a good job in other ones that would provide a little bit more data. So this one just was lacking a little bit of data based on prior cell sites. So. Um, the applicant did supply the total of 13 um, alternative sites. In this case, uh, staff did request the applicant also look at an existing light pole, which is across from Regal Oak Court, a little bit south of Lynn Road. Um, it turns out that this particular light pole is within the homeowner association parcel, and it would actually require a further uh, negotiation from the applicant for the light pole, and that's why it was um, um, disregarded. Uh, additionally, by looking at the light pole across the street, it's not any further from any type of residence, therefore it was not looked at. And that's the other alternative site that was looked at in addition to the 13, unit, 13 sites. Thank you very much. Any other questions of staff at this Commissioner Trapel. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to go back to follow up on what Commissioner Newman was talking about on that definition or condition number 26. Uh, maybe I didn't hear it correctly, but apparently from what I understood is that that's because of a, a new law or something has changed that as of October 17th, it's going to be preempted anyway. Is that correct? That's probably correct. There's a period of time when the commission can relook at the rules that it's proposed to adopt, and that period of time is now. Uh, we don't know exactly when it'll end because the rules haven't been officially released and published. They've just been informally. Which is, which is why we're keeping the condition in at this point. Exactly. Gotcha. All right. Thanks. Yeah, Commissioner Trapel, um, the FCC has been looking at this for, for a while now. Uh, with new definitions and looking at this issue in great detail and various communities. Um, obviously the cell site uh, providers have been engaged in working with FCC and providing information to them. And we've been awaiting kind of this rulemaking decision because we've had some of the, the, the lawsuits or the, the controversy of trying to define it in different parts of the country. Um, and so you've had different courts interpret certain things a certain way based upon the vagueness of some of those definitions. Um, and so we've provided, or the FCC has now finally, as October 17th provided, here's what we think. Now there's another stage where they start having everyone again at, with those rules say, okay, now that we've, you've given us your definition, here are our comments. And then there's a period of time where they, they go through that period of time, like the notices and- Got it. And, and then, they say, okay, here's our final decision. Here's okay, because I just figured if it was going to be exempt, why would we have it in there in the first place? But no, that makes and sense. And my recommendation would be keep it in at this point. Okay, um, perfect. And if it's preempted, it's preempted. Got it. With that, I'm going to move on to our applicant now, Ms. Marianne, Core Development Services, representing Verizon Wireless. Good evening, ma'am. For the record, just your name and city of residence. Hello, I'd like to excuse my voice. I'm under the weather, weather, so please excuse that. My name is Argene Malian. I'm here on behalf of Verizon Wireless, um, and I work for Core Development Services. Um, not to be redundant, but I'd like to go over a few things that were explained by staff. Our proposal is in the public right away for a replacement of an existing roughly 29-foot um, street light pole with a uh, new concrete street light monopole to accommodate the installation of three panel antennas with a proposed radome to conceal all the antennas. Um, all the panel antennas will be fully concealed with the radio frequency transparent canister atop the pole. The light standard will be structured at a minimum height needed to allow for the radio frequency clearances. In addition, all associated equipment and utility cabinets will be installed within an underground vault. The two ventilation stacks as discussed and um, electrical meter pedestal will be installed um, flush with grade. Um, the proposed project has been designed so that all of the antennas and associated equipment be fully screened in order to meet the guidelines of um, not only the city but also to um, um, not interfere with the residential uses. Um, we looked at several alternatives, um, 13 of them, and one of them was one that the city came back with us back, I believe, um, a few months ago, which was across the street. Um, that one was, again, an existing light standard um, that would be the similar design, similar proposal that we would have. The reason that that was not entertained was because that falls in HOA property, and not that we don't entertain HOA property, but the fact would be that if we had a viable candidate that was just across the street that was actually further away from residents, than that of that of the HOA. And there was also issues with the agreements that would need to be placed since these SCE standards, street standards, do become city property after they become a wireless facility. So that would mean that we would have to enter an agreement with the city, the city then enter an agreement with, into, with the HOA. So that consideration and the fact that it was actually closer to residents 
uh, with no other um, benefit, design benefit, we opted to go with our current candidate. Um, the 13 other, the 12 other candidates that were considered, some fell outside of our search ring, so the needed service area. Um, those were the commercial buildings that you see north from our proposed sites. The other ones were, would be similar, would, were basically right of way um, streetlight proposals that fell along primarily Lynn Road. Um, none of these actually uh, propose a better alternative to be further away or to be concealed from residents. Our current um, proposal actually does that. Um, during our meeting, our preliminary meeting with um, city staff on January 16th, um, we had their city staff along with uh, Kramer's office and COSCA and the fire department and DWP. And um, we actually had originally proposed above ground vent stacks, which is typical um, for it creates better ventilation, but we also um, wanted to um, come back with a design that the city would be okay with too. So we went back and came back with, and we found out it would be okay in this scenario to do the flush mount. And um, the issue came up with the equestrian concern as the horses leave or enter, uh, enter or leave the trail. And um, we actually moved our vent stacks further into the landscaped area away from the entrance and the exit of that horse trail. So that was something that we did consider and was brought up at that meeting as a concern. So um, other than that, um, I would just like to know um, that um, this this um, proposed facility is primarily a capacity need. Um, there is an existing sites that are overloaded and there becomes pockets within Thousand Oaks that then become um, a needed area for service. So Verizon right now has several projects that are underway in the planning department to address the capacity needs. This site also fills a coverage need in terms of the in-house service for the residents that are just north of the proposed site. So that being said, um, I'll be happy to answer any specific questions. Mr. any question? Commissioner Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. You. Um, you talked about 13 alternative sites that were considered. Mm -hmm. Was one of them the church across the street at the end of Rivendell Court? Um, that has a tall telephone pole in the middle of its uh, parking lot. Is that the... That's not the community corner, is that? No. Then you right. Okay. This is this is a, a house of worship at the end of Rivendell Court. Can we pull up? We're trying to figure out where this is. It's directly opposite. So so Regal Oak does not go north uh, across Lynn Road, but. If you were to continue north, you would end up okay. in this church's parking lot. So if you were to go north, if Regal Ro Road oh, That's right. would go that's right. further up. So it's off of Lynn Road? That's right. And that's the corner, that parcel, right? There's no corner there, but, but if you were but, to yeah, continue, if you were flying in a plane or a helicopter or something, um, you'd, you'd land in this church's parking lot. I don't see that um, since I've worked on it I can circle back and find out but I know that all by the time it comes in our hands which is the right away team is we've exhausted all um, private landlord options um, typically um, I go ahead and write it up based off of what has been conducted by someone who's handled it before me. And in this case, I don't see it written up, but I'll be more than happy to circle back. But I, 
can almost say that yes, that has been entertained and whatever whatever reasons they were most likely it was private landlord issues can right, come to right. an agreement. So you're saying Verizon did consider this site? I would have to confirm that, but most um, most likely yes, they did. All right. Um, the radome is six feet tall. Do you know how tall the antennas inside the radome are? Yes, they are. Let me pull up the... Or five foot something. Five foot something. Five and a half yeah. feet. The antennas, and they're in the specifications on the I may have missed map. it, sorry. Um, they're about um, 60, uh, the radome is 66 inches. Right. The antennas are um, 60 all right, inches. so that's, that's where the six, the five and a half foot radio yes. requirement comes because from. Because there needs to be some space to accommodate. Okay. One of the conditions um, says that co-location is allowed and may be done in the future. Um, are there any, are any other carriers using the, the facility for, um, once it's built? Are there any existing colo deals that would take advantage of this site? You mean on the existing pool that we're proposing, or just? When you put this radome in, is it just for Verizon, or is it for Verizon and its colo customers? Typically, and right away, um, when it's utilizing a pole, mm -hmm. um, more specifically a street light, it's usually limited to one carrier only because of the structural issues. So on JPA poles or wooden poles in the right away might be a different scenario. All right. And one final question, uh, condition 35 calls for fire extinguishers. Where would those go? Are those in the underground cabinet or It up would on be the pole in the vault. In the vault. In All the right. vault, All underground. Right. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Any other commissioner questions for our applicant? Thank you very much, and I'm sure we'll come back to you in a little bit. We're going to go to public speaker cards. We have one tonight. There you are. Darlene Drezik. Close. Okay. I apologize. Just for the record, uh, your name and city of residence. Um, yeah, let me just get some stuff to get ready. And you'll have, um, a, and you'll have a full five minutes. Okay. My name's Darlene Dietzik, and um, I live in Newbury Park. I've lived here for 28 years. Um, I'm a homeowner in Rosewood. The um, 82 house, it's not a big um, housing development that um, the proposed antenna street light is the entrance for, and I've lived there for 17 years. Um, I did prepare some pictures. In Okay, great, 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 great. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, the proposed antenna street light, to my personal opinion, is an ominous and affordable, formidable entry monument to our Rosewood community. Um, this picture doesn't really do justice to, um, there, there's actually where this says um, Rosewood, um, there's two markers, an identical one on the other side. Um, the open space is, is actually land that the developer worked out with Casca to give to keep this natural looking area natural. Um, it's not attractive because it's not a common site. It, there aren't any other antennas like that on Lynn Road. There's a few in the city. Um, and uh, when you look at it, um, it looks like a alien, sci-fi, kind of curved, whatever. It, it's just not natural. And it most likely has a negative impact on our Rosewood entrance. It's, it's open for opinion. You know, some people like technology. They like science fiction kind of stuff around. I don't know, but it... it it's unattractive, in my opinion. Sorry, I've never done this before. Um, 
These antennas do not um, photograph well. Um, I can't really see what it is, and I did these transparencies because I thought transparency thing, so there's um, this This house right here um, is actually 191 Regal Oak Court. It's the first house as you come into Rosewood. And above the hill, which almost all houses can see, and as you drive in, um, right yeah, here by my finger. We're going to have to try as best as possible to speak into the mic. We're going to add some extra time for it. But no, no, it's okay. You're doing okay. great. Just okay. Um, oh, we have a microphone for you. There you go. Thank you. So um, right here, it's, it's very hard to see, but that's Rosnow Peak. Um, uh, those are the uh, antennas that have been there forever, and including Verizon has um, a couple 80-foot ones. Uh, so the view, this is the view we see um, every day. We see Rasnow Peak. It, it looks a lot worse in person than the um, reflections that the metal gets from the sun, and you can't really take a picture of it. Uh, Verizon's been providing our area service there. Um, and Rasnow Peak is only 5,000 feet from the Rosewood community um, and the antenna site. The alternative antenna sites on business rooftops, including um, the uh, hotel, Coles, um, the, even the Conejo High School there, are part of those 13 sites that haven't been um, given details for. Um, those are only an additional 2,500 feet from Rasno Peak. Um, Verizon itself just said it's supposed to um, supply uh, coverage to the north, which would be on Newberry Road. Um, I'm running out of time. Um, there, there's a clear light of sight. Um, sorry. I think you have this in my email. Um, that's what it really looks like when, when you're looking at it. That's Rasno Peak. We see it every day while going into Rosewood. So this is, this is part of um, their uh, Verizon's wireless um, site, Oak Brook, um, expanded site analysis. And um, this is the only place where it actually says they want to offload the Rasnow Peak um, uh, uh, coverage, and it, it's it's not really. I, I'm over it. Do I need to stop? I, there, you know what? Because of some technical difficulties, I'm just going to let you finish up. Okay, okay. so just. I, I would have done. I know. You know what? Technology is a crazy thing here tonight. So just go ahead and finish, ma'am. Really. Okay. Um, the, these green. Um, this is Verizon's picture. Green sites. Um, this one um, the, uh, is Rasnow Peak. Um, is uh, those are big sites, um, and putting us having us Rosewood offload on that pole is we're in a clear sight of. That's what I was trying to show with the first picture. We're in a clear uh, sight of view to Rasnow. And that's preferable than being all the way over to Newberry Road, even though it's only 2,500 feet, which isn't much when you think of antennas. As I said in my email, a cell phone can transmit, you know, to a tower 20 miles away. Um, can you summarize things yes, now? Yes, I mean, That's okay. Um, this You're is, great. This was also shown um, here along the 101 where it says Coles, Canal Valley High School the um, Marriott Courtyard, those were the alternative sites. These are all the Rosewood line of sight to ugly Rasnow Peak. So the, the non Lynn Road sites are only 2,500 feet away. They're all big businesses charging more expensive lease rates than the city's light pole. Stealth antennas that are easy to expand in the future and Newberry Road business rooftops would not be intrusive. And um, I can't support this project. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. I appreciate it. Any okay. questions for our speaker? Thank you again, ma'am. Okay, thank you. 
So we're going to go back to staff now. Mr. Lynn, any follow-up questions, comments, answers? I'd like to take over some of the uh, responses for staff, if the uh, chair wouldn't mind. Um, in, res in response to some of the things that were raised in the public comment, there were essentially two, uh, two issues that came up. One was aesthetics, and the other one was need and necessity. Uh, let's take the second one first, need and necessity. When we're talking about sites in the right-of-way, the, the discussion about need and necessity is a much narrower one for the Planning Commission. Verizon is a telephone corporation which has what's called a Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity. And under the California Public Utilities Code, that means that they have a right to access the right-of-way. That doesn't mean that they get to access the right-of-way any which way that they please. That is limited to uh, so long as they don't incommode the public use and subject to the city's time, place, and manner control. And within time, place, and manner control and the uh, responsibility not to incommode the right-of-way is aesthetics. Essentially, the city can determine if this is the right place and the right design for this particular site. And so uh, when we talk about ne uh, negative aesthetic impacts, the city should look to its own code because it guides the analysis and determine whether the project as, to, as proposed uh, fault meets the guidelines set out in the code. In this case, it's the uh, council policy. Um, second of all, I wanted to, or I guess third, I'd like to discuss a little bit about capacity and offload. Uh, cell phone towers can't necessarily always be beefed up at one particular location in order to solve a capacity issue. In, as wireless technologies evolve, what they're really looking for is what's called throughput. It's the minimized distance between your cell phone and the tower with, with the antennas on it in order to create multiple outlets for the antennas uh, to receive signals and send signals back to your handset. The idea is that as you pass through an area, you don't have as many people trying to get on one tower at the same time. It's sort of spread out across the, across the way. And so uh, Verizon might tell you, and I might agree, that it wouldn't necessarily fill their technical need to beef up one particular site. But as a um, more legal matter, you might say, the fact that they want to go into the right-of-way sort of limits the uh, discussion down to, is this the right particular spot, and is this the right particular design? Any other questions of the staff at this time? Commissioner Trapel. Yeah, just real quick, and thank you very much. I wish I could speak like you do and use, put all my words together the same way you do. It's amazing how attorneys do that kind of stuff. But the, um, the, there were 13 other sites that we really didn't get to take a look at. Is there a reason, 13 others, so this is the 14th, I'm assuming, is there a reason that those were pushed out? I have a feeling some of them could have been from landlord issues, but... Are there, could, could any other site on those other sites serve Verizon's needs based on staff's recommend uh, research on that? So of those 13 sites, they essentially break into two groups. There was the ones along, I think it's Newberry uh, Road, where there's commercial sites. And then there's ones along uh, Lynn Road, which are right-of-way sites. The commercial sites were, the, the, the response from Verizon was they were too far away from the area of concern that they were trying to address. And in, the, in our reports to staff, we tend to th see their point, but the evidence supplied is not necessarily what we would uh, consider conclusive evidence of, the, of that particular fact. The, uh, it's sort of common sense that it's just a little bit outside of the reach of the area, especially when we're talking about filling a spot that's not a significant gap which is another legal term I'm sorry to use, but it's um, more of, a, of an infill of capacity in a right-of-way zone. The other sites along the right-of-way were rejected because they were all closer to residences. And I don't have the exact numbers and feet as was asked before, but uh, if you want to take a look at the aerial map, it's very clear that this particular spot is adjacent to two open spaces, 
and then across the street from a non-residential use that um, well kitty corner to the uh, house of worship that was brought up earlier can, can i can I ask one more question mr chair and um, this may be mr lynn did we send a notice out to everybody um that was going to be within that perimeter yes the letters and it was sent out in accordance to uh, the notification as well as a large sign was placed uh, at the corner of where the site was going to be uh, replaced um, uh, for a minimum of 45 days prior to your hearing. Okay, and have we had any, uh, any other comments other than what from our speaker to uh, tonight? No, staff did not receive any phone calls or uh, letters. Okay, thank you. Mr. Town? Th thank you. If I could, <clears throat> could just also respond to Commissioner Trapel's comments uh, on behalf of staff. As Mr. May indicated, there were basically two groups of alternatives. One were uh, along Newbury Road, the sort of a commercial slash institutional zone there, and the others were along Lynn Road. The uh, coverage exhibits that were distributed to the commission tonight addressed the uh, areas along Newbury Road, and I think they, they do indicate that the coverage that is sought in this particular case would not be met by any of those sites along Newbury Road based on these coverage exhibits. The other group along Lynn Road were all closer to residential property uh, than the subject. And so while staff did not provide the, that numerical data, that was the conclusion. Coverage maps were not provided for the sites along Lynn Road because that really wasn't the issue. Clearly they would provide suitable coverage. They were in the very immediate vicinity. But this site located next to two open space parcels not near any residential properties was considered by, by staff and the applicant to be well located in terms of being away from residential property and having minimal aesthetic impact. Okay, I, I really appreciate that. That helps out a lot. Commissioner Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just one point of clarification. I think you said in your remarks just now that, um, and this is my first wireless case, I'm just trying to understand the city's authority in this matter. Um, I think you said the city can determine if this is the right place for a cell tower um, based on design and technical grounds. Is that correct? That's correct. If the city would like to have it go to a, a different place, they have to show that there are technically feasible and potentially available alternatives in a relatively close proximity when we're talking about the right-of-way. Can't push it. Uh, a half mile or a mile down the road kind of thing. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to go back now to our applicant for rebuttal. You have five minutes. And for the record, again, of course, your name and city of residence. Sure. Thank you. Argan Amelia, representative for Verizon Wireless Agora Health. Um, Tripp mentioned a few things regarding the CPUC and our right to be in the public right away. I would like to add that it's not Verizon's or any wireless's necessarily interest to primarily locate in the right away. We are limited to design, number of antennas, and we are limited usually to vaulting, which is not the best option. So we do consider uh, private landlords first and for foremost. We get better designs, better height, better space, better everything all around. So when we are faced and then to when we are faced to have a site in a specific area and there are no viable private landlords to entertain or parks or anything that would give us the design necessarily that we would want or the space, we are then we then come down to right away options. Um, looking at our right away options, we looked at a few along R Lynn Road, and Mr. Town mentioned that we faced that this would be the best viable one. In addition to, there's a lot of substructure issues that we face when dealing with City of Thousand Oaks where everything is underground. So that also is a limiting factor when we look at right away installations. For the sites um, north um, that were along Newberry, um, which were the commercial sites, those fit actually outside of the search rings. We provided propagation maps on, propagation maps on each one of those alternatives and why they wouldn't technically meet the needs of this specific site. 
Um, uh, we can we are limited to how far we can push a site when it becomes a capacity site, as as Trip mentioned earlier, and we believe that um, the proposed location, in terms of aesthetics, in terms of uh, uh, vicinity uh, to residents, in terms of everything, meets everything that the city is looking for. Um, we have addressed every alternative that has come our way in terms of even design, in terms of the ventilations, and we've come back and basically um, proposed or redesigned it to meet what the city has requested us to do so far. And that's it. Do you have any commissioner questions for applicant at this time? No. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. So before I close the public hearing, are there any questions, final questions for the applicant or staff? Then we will close the public hearing. Commissioner discussion, motion. Commissioner Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to propose that we adopt the uh, special use permit 2014 70263 and the oak tree permit 2013 uh, 7457 and I would recommend their approval. Thank you. Discussion on the motion. Commissioner Reynolds. I'll just say that this is the first time that I've sat, I don't know how many I've sat through of these, tons and tons, and that we haven't heard any word at all about the RF factors. And we really heard about the design, and I understand her concern because I express an opinion often about another location and not a Verizon. But um, I can understand your thoughts because it's a beautiful area there, and especially I remember when it was built. And, uh, and looking up at Rasno Peak up there where Tina lives, and uh, it, it's unsightly. But they do have the right, and our hands technically are really tied in approving these. We can't deny because we don't like the looks of it. And we just have to go with the findings that if it's the proper place and it meets the city requirements, we approve it. I know, I know, so. Yeah. But I'm going to support the motion, of course. Either questions or comments or discussions? Mr. Town. Uh, Mr. Lynn just just reminded me that we really didn't talk about whether this hatch would be strong enough to support a horse and a rider passing over it. So if the commission is so inclined, we may want to um, reopen the hearing to invite uh, the applicant back up to address that particular point and perhaps what kind of surface it will have, non-skid, et cetera. <clears throat> I would concur, therefore I will now open back up the public hearing and please call back to the podium. Hello. Um, with regard to the, I believe the issue was the vents, the vent stacks that are flush mount and with regard to if it would support a horse. Um, we have um, one meeting, I mentioned it, when we met with staff on January 16th, um, that was brought up. We have pushed the vent stacks further into the landscape area. I mentioned that earlier, I don't know, it maybe didn't come across. So we did push it so it's not on the entrance and exit of any horse. However, you know, um, Typically, these vent stacks are along major roads and whatnot, and we have not had any issues with regard to any weight support. But if you would like to condition that in any way, that's fine by us. But um, yeah, but these are tucked away in a landscaped area, so they are not right in front of that trail or the access point to that trail. And that was something we discussed as it was brought up as an issue originally when they weren't flush. But that's fine. Thank you very much. In that, uh, I open the public hearing up again. 
we're going to need to restate your motion again. So, uh, yes. Do I need to close the previous motion? You would need to close the previous motion and then make a new one, please. Mr. Chair, I move that we close the previous motion of SUP 2014-70263 and OTP 2013-70457. Further to that, I recommend, uh, I move that we open and recommend for approval um, SUP 2014-70263 and OTP 2013-70457 with the conditions as noted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, going once, twice. Please vote. Motion passed 5-0. And as a reminder, there is a 10-day appeal period with the Community Development Department. We'll now go on to item seven, Community Development Department reports. Mr. Town. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just two quick items. Uh, we will be meeting again on November 17th, at which time we have another uh, Verizon uh, wireless facility proposal for you to consider. This is located on the east side of Herbs Road opposite Los Cerritos Intermediate School, but up in the open space on the Southern California Edison Pole, not near the school. So I um, just wanted to mention that. And then also that the uh, commission had previously considered the justice uh, apartment proposal on Los Feliz Road, and that was approved uh, by city council on October 14th. And that's all I had, thank you. Item eight, minutes and resolutions. I'd like to, someone could make a motion to approve the minutes and adopt the resolutions for our October 13th, 2014 meeting. So moved. Please vote. Motion passed 4-0 with Commissioner Reynolds abstaining. 1234 reports. Do we have any 1234? Nope, reports, okay. Commission comments. Go ahead. Commissioner, uh, I, Commissioner Reynolds. Oh, I just want to wish uh, past council member and mayor Dennis Gillette a happy birthday. Today's his birthday. Are we going to have a happy birthday song? No, I just, <laughs> I just thought, you know. Okay. That's yeah. great. We always called Alex Fiore the father, but okay. we yeah. all miss Dennis Gillette. Yes. He was such an asset to our community. And uh, it's, I just wanted to remind people it was his birthday today. I don't want him forgotten, even though he lives up in Washington. Very sweet. I'm sure he'll appreciate it once he watches the tape, because he's probably an active. Uh, I'm sure, yeah. Mr. Chair? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Nichols. Commissioner well, Trippell. I was just going to, to think, you know, with all of the, uh, with our first case tonight, and this is actually for Mr. Town or Mr. Heher, however, I think it might be a real good idea to see if there's a way that we could actually, you know, create some type of session to go over the Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan again. Mr. Commissioner Newman wasn't there when we were going through that. Uh, I know Commissioner Nichols came on right after it. Most of us were kind of in the thick. And I think it might be a good idea to, if, if we could have a special session on that or, you know, it's just an idea. Maybe I could uh, respond to that. A as was mentioned by uh, speaker earlier tonight, there is a general plan amendment and specific plan amendment right now th uh, that is in the works, that has been applied for and uh, by the uh, uh, Boulevard Improvement District. And it would, the proposal is to allocate some of the citywide Measure E residential units into the specific plan. And so there's a question of how many units to allocate, where would those units be allocated, and there's a couple other related issues. Density is one of them. That proposal will be coming to you for a recommendation to city council, and that proposal will probably be coming to you, I'd say, within the next several months. But would it also and be possible with, for staff just to kind of give a history, just to bring everybody up to speed is, I'm not talking about an hour, you know, just the long term is how that entire thing came together? Oh, sure. Yeah. We can do that, and I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I mentioned the other case because as part of that, when we brought that to you, because we're cognizant that several of you weren't here when that plan went through the commission. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have it and you've looked at it. 
but we can provide, so we will be providing an overview at, as part of that case. But yep. if the commission so desires, we can also provide a, a separate overview as well. Okay, well, I don't want to add extra work. I just think it'd be a great idea. Commissioner Newman. Just two quick points. Um, I appreciate Commissioner Trapel's motion. I think it would be helpful for us all. Um, as the commissioner has probably read the specific plan most recently, um, there is some good introductory material in there about the background, but I think we always can use more context, so I welcome that suggestion. And I also just wanted to welcome Commissioner Reynolds back to her usual spot. It's good to be back at full strength. Thank you. Commissioner Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to remind everybody to vote next Tuesday. With that introduction, would you please finish it up, Mr. Chair? You had to give me all your absentee you, ballots? You, you did that so well. I just, my little <laughs> sticky here, uh, make sure we announced voting on Tuesday. Uh, and also, it's a pink sticky in awareness of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I got no comments tonight from my fellow commissioners. I noticed. Oh, you noticed? Yes, okay. I would adore um, Also, to recognize the, uh, Civic, the Alliance for the Arts 20th celebration this past Saturday was a fantastic event um, just outside in a tented area. Wonderful entertainment, great group of people, some uh, wonderful awards given to folks who have been working a long, long time. And anything we can do as commissioners to help support the arts in Thousand Oaks by simply promoting it as often as we can, I'm sure a lot of younger artists and artists of all ages would benefit from anything that we can do to the table. With that, any other? Commissioner Nichols. Uh, just to uh, recognize Mr. Steve Coffey, who passed away last week, uh, was one of our 50-year residents. He's been living in uh, the Palm Desert area lately, and uh, was a close family friend, and we'll certainly miss him. Thanks for sharing that. If there's nothing else, then we will be adjourned to November 17, 2014 at 630, and good night, Thousand Oaks. Free mulch is available to the residents of Thousand Oaks. This combination of leaves and wood chips helps maintain moisture and prevents weed growth. Bring a shovel and some sturdy plastic bags to the Goebel Senior Adult Center located at 
1385 East Jans Road. For more information, please dial 805-449-SAVE. Los Robles Greens located in beautiful Thousand Oaks. Overlooking the breathtaking 18th hole, the strikingly designed banquet and community center is the perfect atmosphere to host weddings, receptions, banquets, corporate meetings, and any other special events. Whether it's formal or casual, the staff at Los Robles is committed to providing you with everything necessary to make yours an event to always remember. Los Robles Greens. To book our banquet facilities, visit us online at LosRoblesGreens.com. Hey, welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. 
Up next, NASA Edge. On TOTV, government television for the city of Thousand Oaks. Hey, we're here at Winter X-12 in Aspen, Colorado. And you're watching NASA Edge on NASA TV. Welcome to NASA Edge, the show that takes an inside and outside look at all things NASA. And I'm Chris, your host. And I'm Blair, your co-host. And we have Franklin, our news anchor. Hi, Franklin. How you guys doing? Doing great, Hey, Franklin. this is an exciting time for all of us. Sure. Uh, this is a, a brand new show uh, sponsored Premier by... show. By NASA. And inaugural we're be, show. Inaugural show. We're going to be taking a, a, a very hip, non-traditional look at yeah. all things NASA, some of the benefits of space research, sure. and how it ties back into the public, and mm-hmm. how, it, how it makes it relevant in their daily lives. Which, as you know, is a goal of mine, because as someone who's not as familiar with NASA, I want to be in a social situation with complete confidence and be able to say, au contraire, it is rocket science. But we're not going to do it in a technical way, but in a very easy, user understandable friendly. way, user-friendly user way, friendly way. Uh, where we're going to have informative sketches, uh, we're going to have interviews uh, with researchers, mm-hmm. Franklin's going to be providing us some cool news. Excellent news. And we just might be on location uh, on several places like uh, maybe the Winter X Games. Sounds great. Uh, shuttle launches. And we might uh, shoot a show in someone's backyard. Sure. Uh, backyard NASA barbecue. Absolutely. Maybe... Drive the rover around uh, a little bit. You excellent. Know? So we'll oh, see what happens. Little eight wheeling, absolutely, or six wheeling. I, I'm not sure. Which. But before you know, before we move on, uh, Franklin, I'm a little concerned because uh, this is our first show, and our co-host mm-hmm. here is not into it. Yeah, well, it's understandably so. Uh, Blair uh, underwent. Uh, Quarantine, as you did on uh, last it was evening, brutal. Right to let the viewers know out there, we had to uh, go into quarantine last night for right twenty-four here in our hours, studio. just like astronauts do before they go up into sure. space. And so we wanted to experience what quarantine was like, and it was well, a great time. Well, I say I, I mean, I, I want to be trained just as well as they are, but I got to tell you, I have newfound respect because that was that was a terrible. Horrific experience uh, in isolation. Well, I, well, I don't you, actually, you received the frat house version of the quarantine, <laughs> the quarantine experience, Blair. <laughs> being new to NASA, uh, Chris uh, went through a, a less strenuous what? version of quarantine than you did. Less strenuous. I don't know. Well, that would explain your perkiness this morning. <laughs> I'm alive. Well, well, we actually videotaped the whole quarantine experience oh, for really? both of you. And I think we should uh, roll the videotape to let the viewers uh, see what you guys went well, through. This I got to see because well, well, it was traumatic. I say we check it out because we were just right down the hallway. We were right next door to each other. Oh, believe me. So. I know exactly where we were. Okay. Right here in the studio. <laughs> I, I, well, I'm scarred. <laughs> let's roll the tape. <laughs> All right. Let's roll. I got to right. see it.
Oh, my. <laughs> Franklin. Wow. That was brutal. Uh, I'm still reeling, actually. You you, you, that, you got jacked. Out. Yeah, and you were like in the palatial, nice facilities. I it's like in the it. Venetian of uh, yeah. all places. Yeah. And you were... I don't about, know where you were in. Yeah, the white room, the padded cell. I was, except <laughs> well, it wasn't padded. Well, Blair, that was like an initiation to the team, to the team, the NASA Edge team. That was uh, okay. That's kind hey, of welcoming. I, oh, was welcome. Not, I was not involved in this uh, little situation. Oh, that's good. As to a know. co-host, I would have stuck up for you. Well, that makes me feel slightly better. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm going to find out who's behind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and FYI, Chris, uh, you could have tipped more than ten percent. Right. Okay. Well, let's <laughs> let's go to a break. Uh, when we a, come back, he's we'll, a cheap co-host. When we come back, uh, Franklin will do the news. Do the news, and we'll show them our new promo. Okay. Great. We'll How about that? that? Excellent. We'll Wonderful watch promo. Right here on NASA Edge, uh, an inside and outside look at all things NASA. Mars. The Red Planet. Exploring the next frontier. When did you say NASA was getting here? Oh, about 2030. Ooh, that's not good. You think that's bad? So I guess you can't even spare a square. So I have to hold it on Mars. Back on NASA Edge. And inside and outside look at all things NASA. Hey, Blair, before we actually get to the new segment today, I just want to let the viewers know that uh, we're going to be interviewing a good friend of ours oh, this afternoon. Yes. Pat Cosgrove. That's right. He's an engineer from NASA Langley Research Center, and he's going to talk to us uh, about the vision for space exploration and his role in that right. vision. Getting back to the moon. Absolutely. Just be, it's very interesting. And maybe we can uh, talk about a little golf tournament we had with him. If he's willing to talk about it, I think that's a great right. idea. Right. But, but let's go to the news let's right now. Let's do that. Franklin. My Frank, favorite segment, What's Franklin. Up, Franklin? Hey, NASA partnered with Jamestown 2007 to promote exploration, past and present. A team of, uh, from NASA traveled with the Godspeed Sail, which is an actual 88-foot replica of the original uh, Godspeed ship that brought explorers here to oh, cool. Virginia in 1607. And uh, they traveled to six East Coast courses this summer with a specially designed interactive exhibit highlighting the connections between the adventurous explorers who settled in Virginia almost 400 years ago and NASA's plans to explore space and establish a presence on other worlds. So they were like uh, colonial knots. Colonial knots. I guess you, could, you can call them that. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. And uh, at the um, celebration next year, the uh, royal family is actually going to be there. We're going to have the Queen Elizabeth, uh, her family, and I believe uh, President Bush is also going to show up. Hey, this is a uh, great partnership between NASA and Jamestown because it's the whole theme of exploration is, is, is where it's at. It's exploration past, present, and future, and how we can compare and contrast exploration back in 1607. And we need we need to go. We need to be there with the royal family. We do. And, and, and the president and uh, hobnob. We'll see if, if you we can pull some strings. Okay. What's up? What else, Franklin? In other news, uh, the shuttle astronauts will make one final house call to NASA's Hubble Space Telescope as part of a mission to extend and improve the observatory's capabilities through 2013. I tell you what, that's an exciting moment for all the astronomers and scientists out there. Who, Absolutely. Who, uh, at, at some point, we thought that Hubble was going to be NASA's, done. NASA's they, still making house calls. But now we're still making a house call. And uh, along with this 27 terabytes of information that have already been produced in 16 years, 
We'll be producing some more over the next awesome. uh, several hopefully, years. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get some on the show. Maybe we can we share those with people when they come down. So Absolutely, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Hey guys, great. speaking of collecting information, I think yes. that's a great segue into our new uh, yes. uh, segment that we like to call ESA. And ESA stands for Extra Studio Activity, which is an acronym. New NASA acronym. And One of many. NASA is full of acronyms, and the acronym that we actually talk to the public about on this ESA is. NASA. Yeah. yeah. So, um, is that kind of like a man on the street segment? segment? Uh, yes, man on the street. Yes, except yeah. it's an ESA. It's an ESA. And uh, it's, 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 it's a new segment, but I think you'll find this uh, ESA pretty interesting and informative. informative. Yes, yeah. very. Oh, wonderful. Let's go okay. check it out. And mm-hmm. this is uh, Franklin's ESA brought to you by NASA. Five, four, three, two, one. does NASA stand for? Naval and Air Space Aeronautics? Oh, not in Ah, you mean uh, the, 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 the acronym NASA, what does it stand for? Oh, you should... Go ahead, they're, they're interviewing you. I don't know. <laughs> Natural <laughs> Aeronautics Station Avionics. And they're going to kill me at work. <laughs> oh, you work for NASA? No, I work for government. Oh, sh- <laughs> National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Man, he was a Johnny on the spot. What have been some benefits of space research? Oh, Teflon, the non-flushable toilet, I think. I mean, as far as different satellites. Oh. And Cell phones, amongst other things. Our climate and, like, seeing what the weather's changing. Or there's the microbial issues, you know. Memory foam. Memory foam? Hey, foam. Oh, foam! Oh. Memory foam pillow. My bad. Ecology. I guess just knowing more about the universe, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, about end times. It's like we have to go down to space because we're going to run out of room on this planet or something. <laughs> no, you're laughing. <laughs> you're laughing. Hey, but there's plenty of space out here on the beach, right? Yeah, I'm, we're not living out on the beach, though. Where were you when NASA first put man on Mars? I wasn't born yet. <laughs> Neither were you. On Mars, I'm on sorry, Mars. I was thinking moon. Sorry, yeah, my first reaction was moon. Okay, Mars, so, yes. so where were you? New York City. Actually, I was on the beach in Sao Paulo. I don't know that for a fact. But uh, I was, uh, I don't know where I was. I was probably selling hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I was unaware that this actually happened. Probably in school. I think someone's been on Mars. Think someone's been on Mars? Yeah. I know they made a movie about it. I don't recall. Chronicles of Riddick. Man, that's a bit on Mars. Yeah, he's trying to okie doke us. That was the okie doke. No, I didn't put no man on Mars. What are you talking about? Well, we'll just ask some questions. The moon, 69. Good deal. Not on Mars. All right. Mm-hmm. I'll make sure. We're trying to catch me. We're trying to catch me. We're trying to catch me. We're going to get there. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> that was that was a pretty cool ESA. Yeah, that was awesome. Great good job, work, Frank. Yeah, good hey, work. Man, it was it was a lot of fun getting out and talking to the public here in Virginia Beach. That was a uh, hokey doke of uh, all ESAs. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was the okey doke, as they okey say. Okey doke. Uh, and, I apologize. Yes, and it was uh, my personal favorite. Microbial issues. Microbial issues. That's right. And in fact, you know, which was pretty good about the whole ESA segment is that this is what NASA Edge is all about. That's what we're supposed is, to do. Is trying to educate the public about. All things NASA. I'm still learning. And, and well, I'm still learning as well. I mean, there's so many uh, benefits of space exploration. There's so many spinoff technologies. There's so much that's going on at and, NASA. And, and, and guys, we're going to have a whole lot more coming up in upcoming shows. So uh, I want everybody to stay tuned and stand by. So everybody watch out. If you see Franklin coming down the street with a NASA Edge microphone, get to an Internet cafe or something. <laughs> just, come, and, come, just come talk to me. I'm harmless. Hey, it's all, it's all good. <laughs> He's cool, too. Hey, so, let's, let's go ahead and take a break. Okay. Because I think uh, we're about ready. To have Pat Cosgrove on the line, yes. and uh, while we're uh, breaking, we'll show our uh, second trailer that yeah, we, uh, new promo. Produced. That's right, excellent. Right here on NASA Edge, an inside and outside look at all things NASA. All right, that's good. 
How about Pegasus? Like from Battlestar Galactica? Look, if you're going to rip off TV shows, why don't you make it a good one? The new series is awesome. I'm talking Greek mythology. You know, Perseus' flying horse Pegasus. Uh, Greek mythology? Let's go with a whole new style. We have a critical task here, folks. We'll name a NASA's new crew exploration vehicle. Exactly. We don't want to name the thing after some flying pony. Hey, guys, turn on the TV. It was just announced a few moments ago from the ISS that the name of the new crew exploration vehicle is Orion. This is all part of NASA's new undertaking to go to the moon, Mars, and beyond. What about Orion? Orion. Yeah, Orion. Much better than Inkadoo. Inkadoo? Orion's a GM counterpart. I think you just like saying Inkadoo. That looked good. Yeah, felt good. Tell you what, Pat, going back to the vision, I'd love to be the uh, first astronaut back to the moon. Oh man, that sounds great. Just uh, getting out of that spacecraft and just uh, setting foot on the surface. Yeah. Uh, that was terrible. Yeah, I know, it's kind of crazy to think about growing up, seeing it on TV like that, and then we're going to be a part of putting it back in reality. Right. I mean, that's, that's exciting. Tell you what, that's a good shot. That's really going to be challenging, though. It's, just kind of, it's kind of like um, trying to, you know, uh, hit a driver on a short par four and, and tr trying to reach the green. I can see that sort of being a correlation of the challenge it's going to take to get back to the moon. Yeah, I heard somebody talk about the analogy that it'd be like te teeing off here and scoring a hole in one at St. Andrews, you know, over in Scotland. Oh, God. And it is a lot like down. the pros, you know, I mean, not to blow our own horn or anything, but uh, we do make it look easy. You know, all the launches we had during the Apollo era and during shuttle era, I mean, after a while, it seems like it's a piece of cake and, it, and it's, it's really difficult. We're finding out just how many things we have to relearn from the Apollo days. and. It's the same thing with the shuttle program. You know, it's, you know, the public thinks we just go up, you know, every every few months, and it's a piece of cake. But it takes a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of uh, challenges that we have to overcome. Well, speaking of challenges, where's Blair? Have you have you? Uh... Yeah, I don't, I don't know where the heck he's at. I mean, he's. You would think he would be a scratch golfer. He still needs to get a little practice in. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we make sure he's doing that? Yeah, let's go check out at the uh, check him out at the putting range. See if he's there. Sounds good. Okay. Scratch golfer? Let's go, let's go see him. Oh. English major. You know, I know I know that we didn't do well in the tournament, and that's largely my fault, but on that last shot there in the in the footage, I thought I looked great. Blair, come on. Not do well in the tournament? Pat and I carried you all the way through. You didn't, we didn't even use one of your shots in the tournament. I, I, I know, and I appreciate you still being kind, but um, hopefully Pat will still talk to us. I think we do have him on the line here. Pat, you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Please. Pat, how you doing? Hey, good. How's Please it going? Please forgive me. Hey, I apologize. Uh, Sorry about that. Blair is not a scratch golfer. I don't know who told me that, but I do apologize, and I'll make it up to you. No worries. It was fun. Well, well, Pat, we're glad to have you here today. What we wanted to do is start with a few quick questions that we actually posed, or Franklin uh, asked the public when he went on one of his extra studio activities. Um, and we just, if it's okay with you, we wanted to run you through the same uh, rigorous questionnaire. 
Sure. And we are going to keep score, Pat, since you are the first uh, official uh, researcher on NASA Edge. Premier um, show. Premier, premier show. interview. And we're going to go ahead and keep a tally throughout the year to see which researcher answered the most questions. That's right. Great. Maybe okay. win prizes. We'll see. That's right. All yeah. right. First question. Uh, what is or What does NASA stand for? NASA. That's the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Oh, very oh, good. Awesome. Right off the bat. I'm very glad good. you got that right because if you didn't, There'd be no interview. There'd be no interview, absolutely. It's called dial tone. Okay, question number two. Uh, What are some benefits of uh, space research? Hmm, Benefits all over the place, but the primary areas, I'd say, are medical, in the area of medical field, also materials, high-tech materials, uh, shape memory alloys. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that, but metals that come back to their original shape no matter what uh, temperature they've been heated to. Is it kind of like uh, self-healing concepts? Uh, well, it's more for structural uses, you know. I mean, okay. materials that just come back into shape. Wow, there are like six interviews I want to have now just based on that one concept. And yeah. we, got plenty, we got plenty of shows. I know, this I know. This is the first it's, show. I'm getting giddy. This is just the beginning. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right, Pat, we got a third question here, and this is probably the most important question yes. uh, that Franklin, when he went out to the, to the beach to uh, see what kind of answers he could get. And you might have to think about this for a few seconds. Uh, where were you when man landed on Mars? <laughs> well, human beings have never landed on Mars, Chris. Now, are you sure about that? I am almost positive. Well, we have somebody <laughs> who was in New York City when it happened. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and some people in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo, yeah. No, it's going to be a couple decades yet. Okay. Okay, well, okay. well, good. Well, I think he got the three questions yeah, correct. That's your three for three. So right. 100% for Pat Cosgrove and episode show number one. Yes. So we can keep that. All and right. uh, th- these are more subjective questions for the rest of the inter- interview here. Um, okay. First, um, this would really help me since I don't know as much, as, certainly as much as Chris, but uh, tell us a little bit about the vision for space exploration. Well, the vision for space exploration begins with uh, starting to retire the current space shuttle. The shuttle's been around for a few decades, and we're building a new vehicle to replace it. Awesome. And we got to do that in a smart way to make sure that the space station and the astronauts and the research that go on on the space station uh, continue to be supported. That starts in 2010 with the shuttle retiring, and then the follow-on launch vehicle, Ares, that's the project that I work on, is going to start flying in 2014. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the Ares one, it, it looks like uh, the older Saturn rockets. I mean, yeah. it has that style, not the, not the shuttle-esque look? That's right. With the solid rocket booster from the current shuttle program on the bottom and the upper stage engine, uh, an upper stage that carries the fuel and the upper stage engine on top of that, and then the capsule way up on top. And that capsule is, uh, what's the name of that capsule on top? That's the Orion capsule. Ah, the okay. Orion. The newly named Orion, I might add. That's right. Very good. All right. Yeah. And, and so that'll start uh, flying with astronauts in 2014, and then, uh, you know, we're going to continue to expand out, fly into the moon in 2018. And then eventually to Mars sometime right. around 2030. Well, maybe if we're long enough with NASA Edge that we can actually broadcast live on, on the moon right. in 2018. And actually, uh, if you could help us out and make sure we could have a, a presence or a doing show actually on the lunar surface, that would be great. You, would be, you would be the guest of honor. You would be our number one fan if well, you could of course, pull that with, off. with your golf clubs too yes count um, me in i hear the view from there is incredible <laughs> well i can caddy for you that's from, right I, I won't actually try to uh, play anymore <laughs> so what specifically is your role at, at nasa well i'm the deputy manager of the work that goes on here at nasa langley research center in hampton virginia okay. and uh, what we're primarily responsible for is the aerodynamic database for the Ares launch vehicle so basically what that means is all the wind tunnel testing and analyses to verify, you know, to make sure that when we push that button and we launch with astronauts on board, that that vehicle is going to perform just as, as we plan and safely return astronauts to space. Oh, well, Sounds like a pretty important job. Yeah, exactly. And I, I wonder if Thomas had a database that he used when he pulled me out of quarantine and launched me across the room if uh, 
he knew that that was going to work out as well as it did well, for I'm him. I'm sure that database is quite extensive. Hey, Pat, if you don't mind, this is great stuff. Uh, if you could stick around for a little bit longer after the break, could you come back and answer some email questions? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Perfect. I just stay on board. Uh, don't hang up. We'll be yeah. right back. Great. It's Chris and Blair on NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. Welcome back to NASA Edge with Chris and Blair. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. And Pat Cosgrove, who's agreed to stick around and answer a few emails. And so let's just jump right in. Great. Hey, Pat, we got a, a few emails uh, from people around the country who like to ask you. Uh, just you know, Some are personal and some are, are generic. Uh, first question we have is from Katie in Lynchburg, Virginia. And her question is, uh, what made you want to be an engineer? Uh, well, I was always good at math and science, and my dad was an engineer, so he just kind of steered me in that direction, and I went with it. And we have one here from Sid in Ontario, California, and he says uh, he knows you like golf, uh, but he wanted to know, what do you do outside of NASA besides golf? Uh, well, I love to travel. My wife and I uh, went to Bali on our honeymoon all the way across the world. Congratulations, is, by the way. Uh, be, uh, uh, wait, wait a minute. I, I've heard of Bali, but where is Bali? It's in Indonesia. Indonesia. It's like oh, right okay. on the opposite side of the world. Amazing. Just amazing. Course, we got a lot of family and friends spread, spread across the country, so we love to travel and see them. And love movies, see movies oh. all the time at the theater. Movies and are great. DVDs at home. Yes. Love the bears. What? Go, go bears. Hey, I think we need to cut this interview off yeah, now. Because, I'm sorry. You know, uh, we love the bears, too, especially if they uh, face the cowboys. That's absolutely. <laughs> well, that's... That's going to be in my favor, Blair. <laughs> you know what? Uh, note to self, Pat's no longer going to be on the show, Absolutely. at least not during football season. Okay. <laughs> we, have one, we have another question. Uh, this is from uh, Rich. Uh, he is in, from Los Angeles, California. We have two questions from California. Okay. Kind of neat question. Remember from the beginning of the show, we had the quarantine issue with yes. uh, Blair? Scarred. Who, who was scarred for life now because uh, someone played a joke on him, and he had an empty room last night. Uh, the question from uh, Rich is, uh, if you were quarantined, uh, what would your accommodations be like? <laughs> well, I'd be a, like a major cush living room yes. with a big screen TV to watch my bears, of course. Uh, fireplace, couch, nice cushy couch, and a huge fridge with homemade food. Now, it's, now it's, don't forget the, uh, the net, the golf net inside the room, too. <laughs> it's, it's clear to me that no one can take the rigorous quarantine like, like I can. I mean, I, I guess as a media not, I'm capable of really harsh conditions, whereas, you know, you guys uh, seem to be on the lighter side of uh, toughness here. Well, Whatever. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Pat, well, we want to thank you very much for uh, being with us today. And this sort of wraps up our uh, our email segment. And stay, keep, stay in touch. Yes, absolutely. Well, and, thank you both very much. Appreciate the great work you guys are doing to get the word out about NASA's exploration vision. Well, you make it easy with uh, all the jobs you work on, the cool things you're doing for NASA with the new vehicles and uh, our trip back to the moon. Absolutely. Cool. Okay, well, well, I'll be calling you, uh, if you don't mind, every now and then to, to get an update on, on what's going on and how your job's going. And Sounds it, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Pat. All right. Have You're a great welcome. day. Bye. Bye. Hey, I want to thank Pat Crossgrove for uh, taking the time out of his busy schedule to meet with us today and to chat with us and answer some email questions. Yeah. I'm just glad he's still speaking to me. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm still speaking to yeah, you, too, yeah, I mean, after I've seen that performance. So. <laughs> Ouch. I'm glad well, you guys are speaking to each other after yeah. the way you were swinging the stick. Uh, it, was, it was rough, <laughs> but uh, I have a long history of being very, very bad at golf. I, I thought scratch was a, a negative term. Well, I, you know, after seeing your little quarantine uh, video that Franklin put together and seeing your golfing, I can see how well, you're, maybe you're a little I'm, just uncoordinated. Maybe I have a shoulder injury or something from that, from that parabola I did in the hallway. <laughs> hey, well, we got plenty of shows to work on your okay. game and to work Fair on, enough. you know, getting you in touch with NASA, so... Still need to do that, for sure. Hey, our next show is going to be uh, at the Second Space uh, Exploration in Conference Houston. in Houston, Texas, Houston, from Texas. December 4th to the 6th. Be great. And we look forward to be going down there and maybe visiting some folks, not only from the NASA community, but from the aerospace community as well. Yeah, which will be great. And Franklin, I'm sure, will have another ESA for us. Citizens of Houston, stand by. I'll be on my way soon. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> good deal. Awesome. Yes. Hey, by the way, uh, we want to thank everyone today. Yes, uh, all our guests, everyone, and crew involved. Please uh, come back to see another episode of of NASA Edge.
an inside and outside look at all things NASA. Have a great day. So, Doug, why do we use sounding rockets to study the auroras? The sounding rockets have many advantages. They're sort of complementary to the satellites. So the satellites usually have a very extensive instrumentation. They're very expensive, very complex, and they have a lot of capability. And what they do is they fly more or less horizontally through the region. So one advantage of sounding rocket is it's suborbital. It means it doesn't orbit. So it goes up and it comes down. So if you want to get a vertical profile of what's happening in a region, you might use a sounding rocket because you can say, I'm going to launch from here. I'm going to go up and I'm going to come back down. I'm going to measure as a function of height what's going on. Right. The satellite gives you a complementary view. What's happening as a function of, of horizontal distance. Just give me a slice. A slice, right. exactly. Now, do you ever launch a sounding rocket and have a satellite going over at the region at the same time? People do that. Uh, Tom Woods at the University of Colorado does that with the uh, SDO. They've got an instrument on board SDO that needs calibration. So they're looking at the sun. They're making the same measurement with the sounding rocket to try to get a good calibration. There have been other attempts to have a satellite go by, and maybe not exactly at the same moment, but nearby in time to do an underflight. And we want to do more of those experiments. Now, you just had a successful mission just recently called Visions. So what's the Visions project all about? Well, Visions, we like to have these acronyms. So, <laughs> so Visions is sort of an acronym that tells you what the mission is. It's using imaging as opposed to direct measurements along, this, along the trajectory to measure a phenomenon that we've known about for a long time but never have had pictures of. And that phenomenon is called the auroral wind. The auroral wind. The auroral wind. Wow. You've heard of the solar, solar wind. Solar wind, yeah. yeah. The auroral wind is a, is a wind of gas or ions that come out of our atmosphere, and they're driven out by the aurora. The aurora comes in, heats the atmosphere, gets it energized, and boils this atmosphere off. So it's a pretty weak, th thin stream of gas, but it turns out to be very important because space around Earth is so empty, the magnetosphere is so empty, that having this gas, this oxygen flow out, can dominate, at least temporarily, what's happening out in the magnetosphere. And what drives it out is the magnetosphere itself. So it's a feedback loop where the magnetosphere drives the aurora, the aurora kicks the oxygen and the auroral wind out, and that regulates or, or feeds back on the magnetosphere itself. Now, is it a certain level of storm or, uh, that, before you launch that sounding rocket? We launched into a, a pretty, uh, well, I guess you might call it a minor substorm. Okay. One of the advantages of the, of the rocket program, in addition to this vertical profile, is you can wait. And you can sit there and wait for 10 nights in a row and wait for hours each night to try to get the perfect time. With a satellite, if you zip through and then something happens, you miss it. You know? So we can wait until there's an aurora right in our path and right at the right time and then go. So what, what kind of in instrumentation do you have on board to be able to, to make those measurements? Okay, we have uh, some things that would be familiar to you. We have a four-channel camera where we have uh, four different colors of light that we're looking down. We're taking pictures from above looking down on the aurora so we can see where the aurora is intense and where it might be driving this oxygen wind out. Our other major instrument is something called the MELINA instrument. MELINA stands for Miniaturized Low Energy Neutral Atom Imagery. And MELINA, what it does is it makes pictures by looking at where atoms are coming from. So instead of looking at light to make a picture, it counts how many oxygen atoms are coming at every point. It spins around, it's like a catcher's mitt, and it looks over there and says, I've got so many oxygen atoms. It looks over here and says, I've got so many oxygen atoms. And it makes a map as it spins around, builds up where those pictures are coming from. And we want to check how are they increasing as we go up in altitude? How are they corresponding to bright points in the aurora? So we have this camera looking down and saying, there's bright aurora over there. Is there also oxygen coming from that region? We also know that not all aurora are created equally. Some are very energetic and penetrate very low in the atmosphere, and those are usually green. Right. And then we have some that are less energetic, and they penetrate to a higher altitude, and they're red. And we have some evidence that the red aurora is a little bit better at, at energizing this atmosphere out. So we use our green and our red channel from the camera to say, okay, where are those oxygen atoms likely to be coming from? And we want to check our theory by looking where they're actually coming from. And, of course, when you're launching these sounding rockets, you're just not launching them anywhere in the country. You're trying to get into the, into the aurora zone up by the Arctic Circle. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Fairbanks is a famous place to study the aurora. I mean, we have all kinds of tourists from all over the world, mostly from Japan, actually go there because that's a very good place where the skies are clear. It's cold but not too windy, and the aurora is very common every other night, every third night. So it's a great place to look at the aurora. It's also the only land-based rocket range in the U.S. It's operated by the University of Alaska for NASA, and it's got this great downrange facility where you can put cameras and magnetometers on an ocean range like Wallops, you can't really instrument under where the rocket's flying because it's the ocean. But up there, you can put your instruments 
under the rocket trajectory and really get a good picture from cameras looking up as well. I guess it would be hard to, to launch from WALPS because they're so far south. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we do lots of great launches from WALPS. We do have interests in the atmospheric physics over WALPS. There's a lot of interesting stuff that happens here. But to study the aurora, you go to, you know, basically Alaska or Norway or Sweden. Right. Now, you had a successful launch, so can you share some of the data that you uh, received? Sure. So we saw that we had great electrons coming down. We saw the aurora was very strong, and we saw that our aurora camera was working well. And the Molina instrument is a new instrument, so we're still kind of learning how it works. But we've already seen the fact that the altitude dependence of the oxygen atoms is very distinct. As we're below a certain altitude, the oxygen atoms don't travel very far, and they sort of run into each other. And then as we go above a certain height, they can start to travel long distances. We can start to make these pictures. Okay. We've already seen sort of a directionality to that, where we can say there are hot spots in these, in these oxygen atoms. We haven't yet made the mapping of how those hot spots map to the rural features, but that'll be our next step. Hey, we're here with Bernardo Petit from the European Space Agency, and today we're going to be talking about the Orion Service Module. Uh, Bernardo, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. How is ESA uh, going to be leveraging the ATV technologies into the Orion Service Module? Right. Let's first see what is the service module. Let's imagine it as a big truck, which is pushing the crew module. So what does a big truck need is an engine. So essentially, it's a big propulsion module. Okay. That's where the analogy stops because it provides also other services to the crew module, power, storage of consumable, heat rejection. So many of these features are already built in onto the ATV propulsion module. So we are going to use similar architecture and put together similar equipment. Sometime we are going to customize it and make it work for beyond LEO mission. And also you may be putting in some cutting edge te technology into the, into the vehicle as well. Yes, we are using similar technologies for the propulsion elements, right. where we are using the main engine is a US provided engine right. from the shuttle. Right. We are using other engines that were already in the ATV on the solar panels. You can consider that the solar panels are an evolution from the one of the ATV. Okay. We are using some heritage, but also there is some quite great deal of innovation. The storage of consumable is essentially similar. And uh, of course, what is being customized is the heat rejection, which is quite different, and also the structure itself, because it's really mission tailored. Since the service module will be attached to the, to the crew module, what are some of the challenges of human rating a spacecraft? That's a great point, Chris. Human rating a spacecraft is very different if you do a low Earth orbit spacecraft or if you do an internal planetary spacecraft. Why? Because in low Earth orbit, you are not constrained by mass as much as you are when you go beyond low Earth orbit. Now, the challenge is, is that, of course, the crew has to be absolutely safe, right. but we have also to respect the very stringent mass constraints that we have. So that's where the challenge and the ingeniosity of our engineers is required, because you can't just make it everything double. If you put everything double, that will never fly. It will be totally safe, and it will be even safer because it stays on the ground. So it is a mix of redundancy, cross-trapping, reliability, and clever architecture that we have to implement in order to have it human rated to guarantee in the end the full safety of the crew. So it's very important when you do your trade studies that to kind of balance all those, all those components. Indeed, and we are doing that in close cooperation with NASA. We cannot do that on our own. It will never work. You have always to see the vehicle as a single vehicle. There is not such a thing as the crew module and the service module that will never work. You have to think about the Orion vehicle and to have an integrated right. architecture that satisfies the requirement of human rating. When we develop a spacecraft that big, uh, it's hard to rely on just one, one country to build everything. Who are some of the partners uh, for ESA in developing the service module? Yes, it's a very articulated effort in Europe we are having to participate and build this service module. It is led by a country and a company, country being Germany and the company being Astrium, located in Bremen. And there are many other countries in Europe, France, Italy, Spain, Belgium, Switzerland and some other countries that are also supporting the development of these spacecraft. Uh, in Europe we are quite used 
to do cooperation within countries. That's all about ESA. The list is very long. I've just mentioned the important one that are providing hardware that then will be integrated in Bremen and then shipped to KSC for uh, final integration and test with the rest of the Orion spacecraft. Is the service module going to be reused every single time or is it something that you'll have to rebuild each time? We have to rebuild each time. The service module is totally expandable. It is being separated from the crew module before entry, mm -hmm. so it burns into the atmosphere while the crew perform entry and, of course, right. land uh, safely the astronaut uh, on the ground. Now, you currently work on the ISS as well. That Indeed. How different is the challenge of, let's say, constructing the International Space Station and maintaining it in low Earth orbit as opposed to developing this new spacecraft going beyond low Earth, low Earth orbit to, to Mars, to an asteroid, or, or, or beyond? This is a great question, and I'm very grateful of it. If you want to see, the ISS is a big modular house, which you can build like Lego pieces. Things have to be compatible, but not necessarily totally integrated. You can have design freedom, build a module in one way and the other one different way as long as you plug them together and they work. A spacecraft like Orion is a totally integrated spacecraft. You can't afford multi-design philosophy in the architecture. Right. It has to be really integrated because otherwise you lose one thing. You lose the efficiency, the mass, and uh, uh, in the end the performance of your spacecraft goes down and right. you don't perform the mission. As opposed to the modularity of the, the ISS, which has been built in various pieces, then it never suffered of the mass uh, uh, criteria. Okay, what you do if it is more heavy, you have a shuttle fly extra, right, right. which is, of course, a bit more expensive, but it's not a go, no go. There it's a go, no go. You can't afford right. to have multi philosophy for the design of the spacecraft. You know, human exploration has always fascinated the public. And we, sometimes we have a challenge you know, in the United States to, to, to get kids excited about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What do you sort of see the European people in terms of getting excited about human space exploration? Well, I guess we're not that different. Okay. We are facing the same challenges. And we have to explain to the community at large and to the young people that intelligence is a great investment. Right. It is fine to listen to pop music, to watch sport, and I love pop music and I love sport. But intelligence is something very important. Education is very something important. Innovation is something very important. Now, what is the best challenge? What a better challenge than exploring the universe by sending three or four of our colleagues beyond our low Earth orbit and looking what is there? I think this is extremely exciting. There is room for all the creativity of all of us in there. You can be an astronaut, you can be an engineer, you can operate, you can, there is room for everyone on this uh, great trip. And I think this is the challenge of our society, to understand how much this is important. Now, when that service module is built in Germany, are you going to find a place to kind of sign your name inside? Well, we are negotiating that very hard, <laughs> but I think uh, we'll, we'll find a way to have a, our name. And, uh, unfortunately, it's going to burn down the atmosphere, so, but at least we'll, we'll, we'll have our picture taken before the launch, right. close to the, the little encryption on the structure. Well, Bernardo, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. It was nice to have you here. Preventing thefts and burglaries from vehicles can be as simple as removing the valuables from your car and locking the door. Thieves use a variety of methods to get into cars. First and foremost, they're going to target the cars that are left unlocked. Other methods they use might be a Slim Jim or some kind of pry tool. They may even use a rock or a brick from your yard. One method that you wouldn't have thought of is a simple porcelain chip like this. The best way to avoid being a victim of this kind of crime, lock your car, but also remove the valuables before you go inside. For more information, contact our Crime Prevention Bureau at the Thousand Oaks Police Department. Thank you.
free mulch is available to the residents of Thousand Oaks. This combination of leaves and wood chips helps maintain moisture and prevents weed growth. Bring a shovel and some sturdy plastic bags to the Goebel Senior Adult Center located at 1385 East Jans Road. For more information, please dial 805-449-SAVE. Los Robles Greens located in beautiful Thousand Oaks. Overlooking the breathtaking 18th hole, the strikingly designed banquet and community center is the perfect atmosphere to host weddings, receptions, banquets, corporate meetings, and any other special events. Whether it's formal or casual, the staff at Los Robles is committed to providing you with everything necessary to make yours an event to always remember. Los Robles Greens. To book our banquet facilities, visit us online at LosRoblesGreens.com.
Perkins! Yeah, Coach? It's time to get back in the game. I don't know, Coach. I feel kind of worn out. Yeah, kid, I've noticed. That's why you need to get with the program. The program? Yeah, the Nike Reuser Shoe Program. That's where people can clean out their closets and bring all their old athletic shoes to any one of the approved sites for recycling. You see, instead of going to a landfill, they get ground up and used to make brand new athletic surfaces, like soccer fields, basketball courts, and running tracks. It's good for the environment and benefits the whole community as well. Gosh, so how can I find out more? Just call the City of Thousand Oaks at 805-449-SAVE or look them up on the web at www.toaks.org. Perkins, I know you're a team player, so get back in the game with the Nike Reuse a Shoe program. Okay, coach, I'm out of here. Ah, that kid. <laughs> he may not be MVP, but he's a real contributor.
I wanted to give you a little bit of a um, program notes on the first half of the program. And um, in my deep copious studies, I discovered that every one of the composers is brilliant. Uh, it's really quite marvelous when you think about all the wonderful things you're going to get to hear today. Uh, Jake uh, Kim is going to be playing a wonderful concerto by Mozart. And this is um, the third of three wonderful concertos, and it is the most popular uh, one that he wrote. The con classical concertos first movements, and we have a mistake in the program, it says adagio, which is the second movement, but he's actually playing the first movement, which is marked allegro, or lively, or quick. And these first movements usually follow a program of form, which is called sonata allegro, in which main themes are introduced, repeated, so that you can hear them, and remember them, and then they're developed, and then they're recapitulated at the end, to bring it into a nice rounded form. Then, uh, just before the piece ends, the soloist, in this case Jake, will play a cadenza, which originally was improvised, but Mozart did write many of them out, and he's going to be playing one of the original cadenzas. In a concerto form with orchestra, the orchestra presents the first themes, and then the soloist repeats them, and so you'll have this double exposition form. It's very common in so many of the uh, concertos of the classical period. You're in for a treat. Again, thank you very much, and enjoy the program.
Kevin Yu is going to play a concerto by Bach. This was a keyboard concerto written for harpsichord uh, because the piano wasn't invented then, but it just translates so well into the uh, modern piano. In the Bach concertos of the Baroque period, the soloist plays all the time. And this opening section with the orchestra is referred to as the ritornello, or in the return. And you hear this opening theme several times throughout the first movement. This is an ebullient concerto, one of great joy. And it's a marvelous piece. Kevin plays it beautifully.
uh, Jung is going to be playing the Haydn Concerto in D major. One of the most interesting things about this concerto is that our conductor, John Rochino, made his debut playing this concerto when he was a boy. And he likes to remind me about that, and he showed me a wonderful picture of him with his nice bow tie when he was about 10 or 11 years old playing it. Um, I tried to do as much research as I could to find out more about um, the composer Haydn, and there just isn't that much written. And then I realized that it's because from the day he was born, he was always a Haydn. Thank you, thank you.